Welcome back to Eternal Perspectives, the podcast edition. My name's Leland, and this is episode four, and it'll be titled The Restoration of All Things, Cosmology Part One. And I appreciate you being here. Thank you. I know the first three episodes were really long. This one might not be as long, but um, just want to set it up here in that uh, if you're only listening to this, I'm writing these as essays on Substack. And I'm reading them here and just kind of giving a freestyler elaboration. But if you'd like to follow along and click on the links and see the scriptures that I put in there or the images that help complete some of these ideas, um, you'll find them on that Substack page. It's eternalperspectives.substack.com. And so the first three episodes we've had uh, the laying of a foundation here. And I, I, I'm doing this intentionally because we have to go line upon line if we want to delve into speculative things or go out into the world for information. We need to be armed with a knowledge of the iron rod of the of the word of God and have it be sown into our hearts and foundation that we choose it over anything we might find in the world um, whenever there's a conflict. So this is important to set this foundation up. And these were the first three episodes. I consider them like the first three stones. And this next bit on cosmology will be the final uh, fourth stone because we set up here in episode one we talked about the doctrine of christ uh, in episodes two and three we talked about controlling our mind and heart our thoughts and our desires a broken heart and a contrite spirit and the repentance mechanism to to propel us into um, higher realms of understanding greater light and knowledge so that we might be filled with light and uh, and grow into the principle of revelation as is the goal so this is important all these things are important and this fourth piece here now uh, we went inward with the first three episodes, wanting to lay an inner foundation. Cosmology is the outer portion of that, the environment that we're in, understanding where we are. So let's get into it. Okay, so the first section here, uh, it's called In the World But Not of the World, a bicameral perspective. And I start with a quote from Marcus Aurelius. It's a little wordy, um, but just listen to it. This thing's going to pop up through the rest of the essay about knowing who we are and where we are being important. It goes like this. He who does not know what the world is does not know where he is. And he who does not know for what purpose the world exists does not know who he is, nor what the world is. But he who has failed in any one of these things could not even say for what purpose he exists himself. What then dost thou think of him who avoids or seeks the praise of those who applaud, of men who know not either where they are or who they are? To me, that's thought-provoking. It's, it's provoking to say that you've got to know not just where you are, that you're on a planet on this earth, where in space. Like You've got to understand these things as well as, as who you are to, to know you, what your purpose is, to know why you, you, you are doing anything any, at any time. Right? These are important things, but most men uh, in the world, as he's kind of pointing out, they don't know that, and, they, and, and a lot of people seek the praise of people who don't know that. They don't know what their, their purpose is. Why? So... We know who we are. Let's recap. We are versed in the milk and the honey of the restored gospel. It gives us our, our divine identity. We have our Christ-centered lens, our eternal perspective. It's heaven-focused. And the foundation of our hearts and minds are now striving to be in alignment and work together in unified purpose. And that purpose is to have our eyes single to the glory of God, to circumscribe all things into one coherent whole. And see the first three essays. We are now almost ready to begin using our framework here, to extract truth looking outward into the world. And I have that in quotes because I'm going to say that a lot, the world. Think of it in quotes every time when I say the world. <laughs> but note a, 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 a little bit of perspective first. In John, in the New Testament, 15, verses 18 through 19, the Lord said to his disciples, If the world hates you, 
ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So he's making a distinction between those he chooses, his saints, and the world here in the scripture, saying they're going to hate you. And if they love you, it's probably not a good thing, right? Because you're not of this world, and so they're going to hate you. So as a child of the covenant and as a seeker of further light and knowledge myself, here, I need to consciously remember or remind myself that our current sphere of existence is one of nestled and intermingled kingdoms, worlds within worlds, right? We have celestial, terrestrial, celestial kingdom-bound children of God all currently inhabiting the same general kingdom of earth, and they're performing the days of their probation. I put a little footnote in here, or in parentheses, the words, uh, instead of, or right next to kingdom of earth, the kingdom of Edom, or Edumea. And the link here takes us to the Bible dictionary of that, where it just lets us know that Edumea is used to represent the world, okay? And um, I point this out because this language, I'm just now trying to brainwash you with it. This is, this is going to come up here in later scriptures that I have quoted here, but in You'll see it in your own reading of the scriptures. When the Lord uses the word Edumea, it is in a macro context, in this big picture kingdom of the, the world versus the saints type of context. That's important because this is what I'm trying to get at, this bicameral perspective, a binary perspective, a, a us versus them, a house versus house um, type of game, a tug of war. So we'll read on. I'm jumping ahead of myself. I know I wrote a lot of these things already, but I'm excited. Okay, so while the reality of our current melting pot here in the earth, different kingdoms, right? People living different laws. It is extremely complex. We can confidently, though, reduce it all in an eternal perspective as we zoom out to view the situation through our lens centered over the restored gospel. Returning to the celestial kingdom is the only option in our mindset. It's the only thing that we focus on as a covenant people. It is the desired outcome of God the Father for his children to be with and be like him in eternity. We are a celestial covenant people living within the world, but we are not of the world. We are a peculiar people over whom the Lord himself leads, and he expects us to see things differently. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 1, verses 34 through 36, the Lord says, And again, verily I say unto you, O inhabitants of the earth, everybody, I am willing to make these things known unto all flesh, and these things being the doctrine of Christ. For I am no respecter of persons, and will that all men shall know that the day speedily cometh, the hour is not yet, but nigh at hand, when peace shall be taken from the earth, and the devil shall have power over his dominion, his house, his kingdom. And also the Lord shall have power over his saints, and shall reign in their midst, and shall come down in judgment upon Edumea, or the world. So here it is, the big grand conflict of the second coming is reduced to a binary, to a bicameral situation, a house of the devil versus a house of the Lord reduction. That's what I'm getting at here. The Lord makes that distinction between us, between the saints and the world. In summary, these are the two factions of social reality claiming authoritative truth throughout time. It is the temporary tug of war between two polar opposites. Adopting this binary or bicameral mindset is critical in the effort of Melchizedek syncretism. Bi means two, and cameral means chambers or houses. So the reduction is this. The house of God, or the saints, Zion, versus the house of the devil, the world, or MB. MB, in this context, Mystery Babylon. <laughs> That's a, I, I want to do an entire article on Mystery Babylon, but here is just a brief inter introduction. And don't worry if you get lost in this next uh, section here. I understand it's heavy in prophecy and Daniel's visions and things like that. Um, we'll do essays that... Try to iron these out and make it understandable um, in this cosmic context. But I, I, it's perfect here. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to read through this and we'll get through it. The restored church right now in the latter days, 2022, from 1830 to 2022 here, is currently as an echo or a shadow of captive Israel past. We should all be familiar with this, especially now having finished the Old Testament this year, right? We understand this captivity cycle of Zion, of the saints, of them not meeting goals or going into an apostate state and being captured by the kingdoms of the world that are surrounding them, okay? This is not new. We, we just watch this all over. Now, put yourself, apply that to the real time, real life right now and in context. That's what we're going to do. The world in our time, has enslaved the ecclesiastical body of Christ as, e as Israel in Egypt or Babylon or Assyria or, Greek, or, the, or the Persians or whatever it was, right? All these different types that we have seen in the Old Testament 
we are experiencing that right now. You need to see this, the, the last days, the latter days in that context, that we are captive. But today, it is a mystery Babylon, hidden behind the scenes, who is our oppositional house and captor. This is the world. This is the greater global net of loosely clinging th thrones and governments, and they're clinging together by a secret combination and conspiracy. And these are, the, these are the iron mixed with clay in the vision of Nebuchadnezzar. More specifically, the Church of God, who is referenced in all of our manuals and stuff uh, for Revelation, the book of Revelation, the woman of Revelation 12 is the Church of God, but it was only restored in an ecclesiastical sense, not the governmental sense. So we are under the, the rule of the governments of the world, this mystery Babylon. So the Church of God is under the current military boot or arm of this mystery Babylon of the latter days. And it's, it's, it's under this, um, this control, this captivity, through the subversion of the eagle. And the eagle is the United States, right? This is the headquarters of the church. This is where the restoration was able to come through because of the constitution, because of the religious freedoms that were offered. It was a fertile soil for everything to happen. But it was subverted. The, there were terrors sown within the wheat here in this American continent, this, this promised land uh, from the beginning. But it was allowed so that the restoration could go forth on this American continent, right? But it doesn't change the fact that the great apostasy marches on. We are the salt of the earth. We've preserved it with, the, with uh, the blessing of the Lord here, restoring his priesthood and revelation in these latter days and prophets and seers and all the keys to the priesthoods and to the sealing power for the temples. Like it's all here. And this is what saves the, 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 the earth in the end. This is what preserves it from utter destruction. Uh, but it doesn't take away the fact that the United States, the eagle, was subverted by this mystery Babylon. Okay, a little bit of a tangent, but I think that context is important. Um, as I'm reading it here, I'm realizing somebody unfamiliar with these things or, or who hasn't uh, listened to my two-hour presentation on Daniel 7 or my you know, two-hour reading of Ezra's eagle and, and comparing the United States to this captive military state, um, I wanted to provide that little extra context here on the podcast portion. But with that being said, keeping in mind the church here is under the military boot of... Um, oppressive worldly kingdoms. Let's read from Daniel 2, verses 40 through 44. And this is the vision of Daniel and these worldly kingdoms that King Nebuchadnezzar saw and Daniel interpreted for him as the worldly kingdoms leading up until the millennium and the kingdom of God, breaking them and taking over. So in these verses, it says, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. And this fourth kingdom, we are living in the fourth kingdom right now in the macro sense. We are living in this, in this fourth kingdom. Um, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. So it's, he's explaining why it's iron and clay. For, so for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in, in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, and they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So pause, pause right here before I finish the end of verse 44. He's talking about this mixing of iron and clay. And my mind and, and the spirit teaches me that this is, this is the Gentile, the, the, the gospel going forth among the Gentiles after uh, Christ establishing his church through the apostles and sending them on that mission with Peter having the vision of the sheet coming down. And now the gospel is not just restricted to the Jews. The priesthood isn't just restricted to the Levites and these things, but now it's being offered to everybody as the uh, preparation for the coming of the kingdom of God, as the kingdom of, of heaven already on earth with those spiritual ordinances and us being able to walk basically in transfiguration in that, in that light. Um, this is what he's describing, this mixing of kingdoms and bloodlines and things. Now it's all mixed together, right? Uh, in the past, in these ancient kingdoms, these ones that ruled, bloodlines were important. You didn't mix things. And that was, uh, think of the themes through the Old Testament that we just heard about the Lord not, not marrying outside of the covenant, not marrying outside of Israel because it caused problems in this regard, in, in order and organization. Um, and in law. So here we have uh, this, this being described as our situation in the latter days under the, for, the, the, under the rule of the worldly fourth beast kingdom in Daniel's vision. So uh, finishing verse 44, I'll just start it over. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. So this is the church, which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. 
Now, we know that this is um, not just the Christian church in general, because that was uh, subverted as well. It, it was the riding along with this beast and fornicating with it, mixing its doctrines with the philosophies of the world. And um, this, in Latter-day Saint um, doctrine, we know that this is the stone cut without uh, hands that comes and destroys and shatters this image is the restoration, the kingdom of God in all its glory and priesthood, the true um, gospel of Christ, which Elijah actually comes and prepares the way to, you know, set up the authority to do that. And we, Elijah came and set up those keys and we have it in the church. and We've had it now for 200 years. And now we're at the very end. We're in the last, last days of the latter days and things are about to go really crazy. But I bring up Daniel in the middle of all this because it is a prophetic scriptural context that is the spine and support of this idea I want to conjure up of the saints versus the kingdoms of the world. Okay. When you read in prophecy, it is always going to break down to this good versus evil, big fight, right? This, this basic binary thing, because that's the biggest view. Those are the two poles. That's the polarity of life, of good versus evil, of dark versus light. This is the checkerboard on the Masonic um, uh, boards and, and imagery and symbolism and stuff like that. This is the, the infinite struggle of polarity. It's an eternal concept, and it's expressed this way in prophecy and in symbolism. So... Uh, when we use our eternal perspective to look at the world, we need to make sure that we're seeing things in this lens, that we're not persuaded by the kingdom of the world, because we'll see it's a foundationless kingdom. Now, the kingdoms of the world here, let me just catch where I was at in this. Um, okay, so we are in the world, but not of the world. So this is this bifurcation, this bi bicameral thought that I'm, I'm conjuring up in your mind. I'm putting the spell on you. I hope you see it. So I have, I, uh, so I have to remind myself to see others for who they are and where they really are, like Marcus Aurelius was saying, and to always and to be always aware that there is a current condition of mixed law or understanding of who we are and where we are. It's the mixed law is being practiced throughout the agency or through the agency of individuals and through a division of literal earthly kingdoms. Some people are forced to live a certain way because of those kingdoms, right? Um, they're not exposed to the truth because missionaries aren't allowed to get there or whatever it might be, right? There's uh, kingdoms that have laws that restrict the agency of people, but also the individual agency of, of most of the people in the free world, right? They're free to choose what law they want to live at this point. The Lord lets them. We can see it for ourselves today. We know also from Nephi's vision of our time, that the size and dominion of the saints of this latter-day kingdom would be small. This because of the whore, <laughs> the whore, the world, right? The false doctrines promulgated by wicked men. So let's read from Nephi, 1 Nephi 14, 10 through 12. In verse 10, he says, and this is, the, again, the vision of the, this last time. This, this is the prophetic vision, the same one that mixes with John's revelation, the same one that mixes with Daniel's that I just said, with the kingdoms of the earth falling and all of this. It's all the same picture seen from different points from these different prophets. And we have the ability and the gift and the blessing of having so much information in Scripture in the latter days to weave it all together into this beautiful tapestry, a restoration of all things that we can see from the beginning to the end. And this is what I'm trying to present, that I have a glimpse into this. I'm barely scratching the surface in my own studies with this kind of thing. But it's this foundational paradigm, looking at things this way, that makes it possible. So pay attention here to what Nephi is saying about us as he sees us in the latter days. So 1 Nephi chapter 14, verse 10. And he said unto me, this is the angel, Behold, there are saved two churches only. The one is the church of the Lamb of God, this binary thinking again. The other is the church of the devil. Wherefore, whoso belongeth not to the church of the Lamb of God belongeth to that great church, which is the mother of abominations, and she is the whore of all the earth. Verse 11. And it came to pass that I looked and beheld the whore of all the earth, and she sat upon many waters, and she had dominion over all the earth among all nations, kindreds, tugs, and people. And it came to pass that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God, and its numbers were few, because the wickedness and abominations of the whore who sat upon many waters. Nevertheless, I beheld that the church of the Lamb, who were the saints of God, were also upon the face of the earth, and their dominions upon the face of the earth were small because of the wickedness of the great whore whom I saw. Look at the repetition of whore and Lamb of God, and this, this it's strong language for a reason, because he's trying to subvert your mind with this big bicameral picture of you're either with God or you're not. Choose now. Choose ye now this day whom ye will serve. But for me and my house and everything I see, it is this bifurcation of understanding. Bifurcation is such a cool word. I had to use it. I love that word because we're going to see that's exactly what happens. It's a forking, a forking of one thing that's true. They want to separate it into a, a bunch of different things so it's more easily manipulated. Divide and conquer. Satan's way. So uh, here's Nephi telling us we're going to be small. He sees us in our time. We're going to be a minority. So as we look outward to add intelligence and information to our gospel-centered paradigm and our personal temple of knowledge, let us be comfortable embracing and understanding this. 
The saints are literally, and especially ideologically, a drastic minority in the latter days, despite our claim and conviction of absolute truth. And we will be the minority in general opposition to the world until heaven is rolled together as a scroll and the throne or house of God is revealed in power and glory. Then every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the king of kings. So let's look at this. Nephi is really hammering this home uh, about a separation of two things. You're either with the church of God or with the church of the devil. This same symbol and pattern is projected in the vision that they're seeing in both Lehi and Nephi. And they're represented in the spacious building, the great and spacious building, and the tree of life. Now, I know one's a tree and one's a building. Oh, Leland, how are you going to compare them? Just listen. The tree can be a building, can be a temple, can be a, all kinds of things. Imagine it now as a temple. Instead of a tree of life, imagine it the temple. Okay, And that's what the iron rod is leading you to, down the covenant path to make covenants, to go into the temple, to ascend and transfigure your heart and become a resurrected celestial being, living, fixed, a jewel and gem in the house and temple of the Lord. Okay, So the tree of life, the love of God, all of that, imagine it as a temple. And the great and spacious building, well, it's the temple of the devil. And we're going to compare these two. So looking at the vision of the tree of life as house versus house. What did the worldly building or edifice of Lehi and Nephi's dream look like physically? How was it founded? How was the whore, the world, grounded? Well, let's read what Lehi said. So in 1 Nephi 8, this is Lehi's account, in verses 26 through 27. And I also cast my eyes round about, and beheld, on the other side of the river of water, a great and spacious building. And it stood, as it were, in the air, high above the earth. And it was filled with people, both old and young, both male and female, and their manner of dress was exceedingly fine. And they were in the attitude of mocking and pointing their fingers towards those who had come at and were partaking of the fruit, those who were in the temple. Lehi describes it as floating in the air. And it stood as it were, he says, in the air, high above the earth. It was foundationless. Are you seeing the picture here? Note the mocking. The world mocks the cosmology of God and the heavenly family. So if you're like a seal clapping right along with the world and their explanations for human life through evolution from a, from a fungus or, or a, a, a single-celled organ, whatever it is, like you're applauding right along with the world, well, you're, you're right there with those people in that floating building mocking the cosmology of God. Nephi's vision or version of the same vision adds more context to this floating house. <coughs> Pardon me. So Nephi, after he sees the same vision, he adds a little bit more paint to the picture. In verse 18 of, of chapter 12, it reads, And the large and spacious building which thy father saw is vain imaginations and the pride of the children of men. Let me read that again because I was kind of spacing out. And the large and spacious building, this foundationless thing, which thy father saw is vain imaginations. Wow, but is that mind control? Vain imaginations and the pride. Whoa, we talked about that too in our mind control episode as pride being the opposite of humility in terms of submitting your will willingly to the father versus being subverted by the devil and captured, captured and brainwashed into thinking that the, the law of the flesh is better than the law of heaven. Wow, I'm, okay, let me read on. <laughs> and the great and terrible gulf divided them. So they've got this building. The building represents the vain imaginations and the pride of the children of men, and a great and terrible gulf divideth them. Yea, even the word of the justice of the eternal God and the Messiah, who is the Lamb of God, of whom the Holy Ghost beareth record from the beginning of the world until this time, and from the time, this time henceforth and forever. Powerful ultimate language there, this macroscape of who God is and what his powers are. Holy be his name. That's, that, I love the language of Nephi. I know that he saw what he saw and witnessed what he witnessed, just the conviction and spiritual power that, that he writes and testifies with. First Nephi chapter 14, 9, he gives a little bit more context about the house, the, the floating spacious building. Sorry, I got like a hip, hiccup or a burp. I got to get just a second. All right. First Nephi 14, 9 reads, And it came to pass that he said unto me, Look, and behold, that great and abominable church, which is the mother of abominations, whose founder is the devil. So what can we take away from these descriptions? Well, the devil is the founder of the great and spacious building, the house, the father of lies. It's also represented as the vain imaginations. And I linked to my mind control one because that's exactly what I'm seeing here. And the pride of the children of men. Pride is the opposite of humility. And a great and terrible gulf divided them. There's a big space and gap between this temple of the Lord and great and floating spacious building of the world. We would, ex we, and we should expect today that a great and terrible distance between paradigms would foundationally exist. That the eternal worldview that we hold is going to look very different and peculiar to that of mystery Babylon and the Gentiles. 
This gap is because the word or the words or the foundation upon which each house is founded are polar opposites. It's truth versus lies. It's Christ versus Satan. It's this big binary picture, right? So you got to understand that there better be a big gap between them according to this vision and according to everything we know and see about the devil subverting all things and trying to deceive the world in the last days. A grand deception would be this, would be a, a, a confusion of what is truth. This dual house or bicameral mindset is a key as we seek to filter understanding and knowledge from the world and the philosophies of men, we must be armed with the knowledge of the scriptures, the iron rod, and the spirit of discernment and truth within our own metaphorical house or temple. We got to be familiar with our own temple, having a clear awareness that our paradigm does have a solid foundation. It's not floating. It is built upon the cohesive doctrine and rock of Jesus Christ. I will refer to the world a lot moving forward. This is what I'm drawing on a bicameral mindset where our eternal perspective will always supersede or be the foundational authority we revert to when information from the world might conflict with the intelligence from God given through his prophets, the word. So we will see this distinction very vividly in our explanation of cosmology, how bifurcated it is, how fractured, how divided it had become from one single truth that it, that it was in the beginning. So a quick review, because this is all kind of leading into cosmology. I wanted to focus on a bicameral thinking and framing. I hope I've repeated that enough that that's, that's in your head. The kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the world. The saints in the kingdom of God are currently a minority voice. Thus, the majority of what's popular today will reflect the state of the world. We are the salt of the earth, small and preser preserving it, right? So don't expect that we have to agree with everything going on that the world says, especially now at this point of the great apostasy and divide of truth from, from reality, right? It should be wacky what the world believes in comparison to what we believe. And I believe that's the case. And that's why most people see what I say and do online as a fanatical, wacky, crazy religious zealot man. So I, I welcome that in this paradigm because it's doing exactly what I would expect. So foundations matter. Expect the world to be foundationless or foundationally lacking. This is where we should first be looking every time we want to incorporate or synthesize some truth from the world. What does the foundation or how does the foundation match to the foundation of the tree of life and the temple of God? So this is where we should always start. Now, finally, defining cosmology. What is cosmology? Cosmology is the study of the order and nature of the universe. And it is the foundational, there's that word again, discipline of all other disciplines because it creates the boundaries and the assumptions upon which a superstructure of information is built. As such, it provides a global context for both our science and culture so that cosmology is sometimes called the queen of the sciences. Let's collect some uh, official worldly definitions to incorporate into our understanding. So from Merriam-Webster dictionary, the definition of cosmology reads, one, a branch of metaphysics, that word metaphysics will come up a lot here, and they call it metaphysics. So a branch of metaphysics that deals with the nature of the universe or a theory or doctrine describing the natural order of the universe or two, a branch of astronomy that deals with the origin structure and space time relationships of the universe. Also a theory de dealing with all these matters can be described as a cosmological theory. So cosmology. So they, I like that they describe it here as a doctrine, a theory, a metaphysics, all these names, astronomy thrown in here. Uh, you're getting the idea of what, it, what, what is included in what cosmology is. Now, from dictionary.com, they describe cosmology as the branch of philosophy dealing with the origin and general structure of the universe, with its parts, elements, and laws, and especially with uh, such of its characteristics as space-time causality and freedom. The branch of astronomy, or this is another definition from uh, dictionary.com, de uh, definition number two, the branch of astronomy that deals with the general structure and evolution of the universe. Okay, starting to get a bigger idea of what, I mean, we see eye to eye on this. I'm, what I'm defining cosmology as and what they're defining it as pretty much at this point is, is the same. Uh, now from Wikipedia, first let's define what, how they define cosmos. This is important to understand. So the word cosmos is another name for the universe. It's a word, uh, cosmos implies viewing the universe as a complex and orderly system or entity. The cosmos an understanding of the reasons for his ex existence and significance are studied in cosmology. So this is the who we are, the where we are. This is, this is cosmos. This is cosmology. A broad discipline covering scientific, religious, or philosophical aspects of the cosmos and its nature. So they even call it a broad. You know, it's an encompassing thing. It's big. 
Religious and philosophical approaches may include the cosmos among spiritual entities or other matters deemed to exist outside of the physical universe. So in my mind, I'm just blah, blah, blah. When they say all this, they're already dividing up something that is a complete whole. They're already fracturing it here by, oh, a religious version, a philosophical version of this version. And that's exactly what we see here when we look up cosmology in, in Wikipedia. What do we have? A disambiguation, meaning they're taking a big, broad subject, and we're going we're gonna to make it more specific, which I get in academics. They do that. But in our perspective here of house first house, this is the, the exact evidence of a fractured um, mind state, a disassociation that... <laughs> that the apostasy brings. Okay, so let's just read the definition now of cosmology here. Cosmology is the academic discipline that seeks to understand the origin, evolution, structure, and ultimate fate of the universe. The term is also often applied to the underlying model of such a system. Now they say cosmology may also refer to physical cosmology, which is the study of large-scale structures and dynamics of the universe, philosophical cosmology, a branch of philosophy that ponders the universe, and religious cosmology, a way of explaining the origin, history, and evolution of the universe based on religious traditions. I've also seen different definitions break it down into a fourth. They call it mythological cosmology. So they, they cut what I'm seeing as one whole complete thing. You can't, you can't take cosmology and make it a bunch of different things. You can't look at it from different angles and then have them all disagree. It's one thing. So if you look at it from different angles, they should all agree. Yet what the world presents here as this disambiguation, they are not all in accord of what we see and what we are, where we are and who we are, that kind of thing. Only Revelation provides that. This is the foundation list that we're talking about here. So let's, let's get into that. Notice how there is a disambiguation. The world speaks distinctly of a physical, think body, a philosophical, think mind, and a religious, think heart. They set, separate these integral parts that my first three episodes here have been trying to get you to integrate, to synthesize, to bring together to one purpose and one mind. They're separating these things, okay? They separate these in pursuit of understanding cosmology. But in an eternal perspective where there exists absolute truth, there is but one unified comprehension of the cosmos. It is not relative. To have a disambiguation at all is admission of apostasy in Meta. I love that sentence. That's beautiful poetry. This is a big picture manifestation of the parable of the foolish men of today who built a house of knowledge upon a dissociated cosmological understanding of sand instead of building upon the rock of the doctrine of Christ. Let's look at the word dissociated, if that's a new word for you. I have just a generic definition here of dissociate. Dissociate means to separate from association or union with another. Specifically, uh, in, in, chem in um, chemistry, it's breaking apart dissociation of molecules, the different things that are tied together by um, bonds. You break those bonds and dissociate them. So that's exactly what we're seeing here in, in this uh, explanation of cosmology from the world, that they have a dissociated view of it. Our quest right, in Melchizedek syncretism, bringing it all together, is the effort of gathering the body and the mind and the heart together into harmony with the gospel. Our paradigm reassociates. It brings together. It gathers. It restores the physical, the mental, and the spiritual all into one. One heart, one mind, unified in spiritual dominion exercised over the carnal, natural body of flesh. This is Zion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25, reads, that there should be no schism in the body. A schism is a separation, a breaking up, this dissociation we're talking about. So that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Keep those bonds. Don't dissociate the molecule, right? This is, this is what they're teaching, that together we are members. We remember him, meaning put together the different members, remembering. In Moses 7, verses 18, the Lord called his people Zion, because they were of one heart and one mind, and they dwelt in righteousness, meaning their bodies acted in righteousness. And there was no poor among them. They took care of uh, their neighbors. They loved God. They loved their neighbors. This is Zion, all unified, seeking the same goal, common goal. There is only one cosmology, for God is a God of perfect order. And we read in Doctrine and Covenants, section 132, verse 8, Behold, mine house, if we're, we're looking at this bicameral big picture perspective. He's talking about the house of God versus the house of the devil. He says, Behold, mine house is a house of order. I know he's also talking about the temple, but the temple is his house of order in, in, in physical 3D form that we can go and experience for ourselves. A house of revelation, yeah, but it's, it's symbolic of the house of God, of the greater celestial kingdom. So, behold, mine house and kingdom is a kingdom and house of order, saith the Lord God and not a house of confusion. So he's got his kingdom. Now we also know him from Doctrine and Covenants, verse 88, 36 through 38, a little bit more doctrine to add to this context here. 
all kingdoms have a law given. And there are many kingdoms, for there is no space in which there is no kingdom. And there is no kingdom in which there is no space, either a greater or a lesser kingdom. And unto every kingdom is given a law, and unto every law there, is, there are certain bounds also and conditions. There is order everywhere in God's universe. We have available to us through the restoration founded by Joseph Smith in these latter days a cosmic layer of the gospel of Jesus Christ that, that it is unique. Okay, it's unique today to our church and doctrine, but it resonates with world religions to the root, to cosmology, and, and is another prophetic fruit of Joseph Smith. It resonates with these world religions, with, with mystery traditions, with the occult, with all kinds of history and things that we try to ignore, right? We can explain it using our doctrine. We can understand it better comprehensively together. We can turn our hearts to understand the fathers, not just to help seal them and perform their ordinance and, and things like that, or their ordinances and things like that, but also to remember who they were, where they were, and what they were doing. Now, this cosmic layer of the gospel is also ancient and eternal in origin. Our doctrine predates astrotheology. It is nolum. And the link to the word nolum here, if you don't know, it's a word that shows up in the Book of Mormon or Doctrine and Covenants. I can't remember. Maybe it's Abraham. I don't um, know. I think it's Abraham. But it means eternal. It just means everlasting, eternal. Um, again, has to do with this cosmic stuff because you're going to see a lot of Egyptian things if you read this definition. I encourage you to do that. Um, didn't intend to rift on it. So it, it, it's, but our, this cosmic layer that's introduced to the restoration, it's ancient. It predates astrotheology. Why do I say that? Well, because this is a big knock from all the esoteric bros and people out there that explore cosmic things and ancient histories and esoteric uh, occult things, right? They want to say that Christianity is a new religion and that before that it was the Zoroastrians and, and the astrotheologies of the planetary worship, blah, blah. Like they want to get, the, the funny thing is, is that no, like the gospel of Jesus Christ predates all of that. Before the earth was even founded or formed, the gospel of Jesus Christ was understood and taught to all of us who are here. You just have to remember it. That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. This doctrine restored, it, it goes before all of them. This was understood by Adam, and we're, being, we're understanding it now. So this cosmic layer, it can also help to provide further context and light and knowledge to our understanding of the scriptures and ordinances of the temple and the plan of salvation. Um, understanding this cosmic layer, you'll see how prophecy opens up different passages of the, the scripture that pertain to the planet and uh, the millennium or changes of the earth, the miraculous things like the flood or the parting of the Red Sea and the miracles of the journey of Israel through the wilderness. All of these things, um, when, when a cosmic layer is added, the cause and effect becomes obvious. And it doesn't take away from, from Jesus Christ being the ultimate cause, but it adds in more detail to the overall picture that we're seeing in the scriptures. So who wouldn't want to know more about the scriptures and about the ordinances and about why we do things in the temple that we do or about the plan of salvation in whole? You, that's what people reject when I say, hey, let's talk about cosmic things. And they say, oh, you're looking past the mark, Leland. And I'm saying, no, I'm looking directly at it and you're ignoring it. That's the truth about, behind all of this. And th these essays are my proof. Like, this is like, okay, let's, let's have that same conversation after you read these and read the scriptures in context of how I'm seeing them and how it makes my heart sing. So what does this cosmic layer also do? It's also a big reason why the Gentile Christian world perceives our doctrine of theosis or becoming like God, and which is consistent with early church teachings. They see it as pagan and blasphemous. The creedal fornications of the great apostasy had corrupted, or corrupted the plain and precious truths of the Lord's cosmology and divine nature. And so they don't accept these things. The who and the where we are it was further obfuscated by the mingling of scriptures with the philosophies of the house of the world. This is all kind of the effects of the great apostasy. Uh, the creeds I, I see as like uh, the integration of Greek philosophy subverting the real cosmology of God, which is more literal and um, infinite and amazing and... Um, way, way more explanatory as well than the nebulous philosophies of men that want to get into weird mystical beings that are all in one but not, and who, you know, it's much easier to understand um, and palatable and to act on, to, to be motivated with, to understand it in the way that Joseph Smith restored through our temples and through, uh, that I found in my own in my research and studies. So I invite you to, to test these things, right? Don't just believe me. This manifesto is an attempt to present appropriately supported breadcrumbs from my personal study that I hope will demonstrate why I believe Joseph Smith restored true cosmology and to persuade and invite all who are interested to experiment upon the same fruits of a, of a prophet of God. This experiment has supplemented and enhanced my own conversion to the Lord and his church and my understanding of his house and temple. I pray it will for you too. Now, from Elder Maxwell's address um, titled Our Creator's Cosmos, and I've got a link to it here if you want to read the whole thing. Uh, but he gave this in 2002, and I'm going to read it 
in full. Uh, and it's important here. Well, that's big. The late Carl Sagan, who communicated effectively, this is uh, Elder Maxwell. The late Carl Sagan, who communicated effectively about science and the universe, perceptively observed that, in some respects, science has far surpassed religion in delivering awe. And I'm going to do it in an arrogant voice because I hate Carl Sagan, but uh, respect, I guess. How it is, uh, How is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought? The universe, or how is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought? The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. God must be even greater than we had dreamed. Instead, they say, no, 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 my God is a little God, and I want him to stay that way. A religion older new that stresses the, magnificent, uh, the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe that uh, hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Sooner or later, such a religion will emerge. Well, little did he know, religion emerged. Okay, but here's Elder uh, Maxwell retorting to that comment from Carl Sagan. Latter-day Saints should certainly not lack reverence and awe, especially when we contemplate the universe in the context of divi oh, divinely revealed truths. A frog in my throat. <laughs> Let me redo that. Latter-day Saints should certainly not lack reverence and awe, especially when we contemplate the universe in the context of divinely revealed truths. Yes, the cosmos, as revealed by modern science, is elegant, as Sagan wrote. But the universe is also pulsating with divine purpose, so our awe is added upon, providing even greater reasons for reverential awe regarding the magnificence of the universe. Of course, the church does not align itself with the astrophysics of 2012 or 2022, nor does it endorse any particular scientific theory about the creation of the universe. Pause. As I explore cosmological theories and things like that, I don't want anyone to confuse that I think the church must endorse this. I'm saying by the natural order of things, when Christ returns, we will find that alternative theories right now that exist mix much better with the things that I think we will see happen when planets return and Christ returns in all his glory and all, that um, we can see that now if we have these eyes to see. Now, back to Elder Maxwell. As astrophysicists pursue their important work, they use the scientific method and are not in pursuit of, script, of spiritual answers. A few scientists share our beliefs and religious explanations concerning these vast creations, but some, views ours as, uh, but some view ours as an unsponsored universe. Bereft, in, of cosmic, uh, or, uh, bereft of belief in cosmic meaning, some, as portrayed by one writer, view humans as being wretched whimpering into an alien, or wretched whimpering uh, into an alien universe. Resoundingly, the restored scriptures tell us otherwise. We're not alone. We're not wandering around. We're not lost. We know where we are, who we are, is what he's getting at. But we do the sweeping scriptural words with which, uh, but do this. Man, I cannot read this one. <laughs> I apologize. We're start over here. But do the sweeping uh, scriptural words with which we have been blessed stir us enough? Are we steadily becoming the manner of people who reflect such soaring doctrines by our increased spiritual sanctification? Brothers and sisters, God is giving away the spiritual secrets of the universe. But are we listening? That quote was used by President Nelson recently in his revelation for the church and uh, for our time. Um, he quoted Elder Maxwell there saying that. That was in 2002. And then it continues. He says, In daily discipleship, we are rightly instructed to lift up the hands which hang, which hang down. And that's in Hebrews 12.12. 12. Why not also strive to lift up the sometimes passive and provincial minds that also hang down, unnoticing of the stunning scope of it all? Given all that God has done to prepare a place for us in the stretching universe, might we not develop and display greater faith? In the perplexities and crunches of life, will we have faith in the Creator's having made ample provision to bring all His purposes to pass? Years ago, President J. Reuben Clark Jr. made this comforting statement. Our Lord is not a novice. He is not an amateur. He has been over this course time and time and time again. Brothers and sisters, has not the Lord described his course as one eternal round? Greater appreciation for the greater universe will also help us to live more righteously in our own tiny universes of daily life. Likewise, a better understanding of God's governance of the vast galaxies can lead to our better self-governance. Boom. As Elder Maxwell instructs, a better understanding of God's governance of the vast galaxies can lead to our better self-governance. That's what this is all about. That's what we're shooting for in our quest to capture every thought unto the obedience of Christ. This is exactly the kind of endowment of further light and knowledge that we seek. Don't we want all the help we can get to secure a more sure pathway home? I've included a lot of scriptures here that I encourage everyone to read. Um, I'm not going to go over them 
now because I don't want this to, to be too long because I have like all of chapter or all of Second Peter uh, chapter one having to do with uh, the more sure word of prophecy and calling an election and that kind of thing. Like this is this is the idea. Not that um, I want it to get weird or anything, but we need to have higher vision. This is what our restored temple worship provides us. We are invited to go up to the house of the Lord and to seek this wisdom. In Isaiah 2, 2 through 5, he saw our days. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house, the temple, shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted from above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat down their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Consider this question. When Abraham used the Urim and Thummim, or when Moses or Peter, James and John were transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, what were they shown? What were they first shown? Let's look at Abraham. Abraham's account in Abraham 3, 1 through 3. And I, Abraham, had the Urim and Thummim, which the Lord my God had given to me in Ur of the Chaldees. And I saw the stars, and they were very great, and that one of them was nearest unto the throne of God. And there were many great ones which were near unto it. And the Lord said unto me, These are the governing ones, and the name of the, the great one is Kolob, because it is near unto me, for I am the Lord thy God. I have set this one to govern all those which belong to the same order as that upon which thou standest. It was planets and stars, the throne of God, governance and order, perspective, an eternal perspective that includes and is integrated with the cosmos. That's what Abraham was shown when he looked into the Urim and Thummim. What was Moses shown on the Mount of Transfiguration? Let's read in Moses chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The word of God, which he spake unto Moses at the time when Moses was caught up into an exceedingly high mountain, oh, like Nephi, and he saw God face to face, and he talked with him, and the glory of God was upon Moses. Therefore Moses could endure his presence. He was transfigured. And God spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, I am the Lord God Almighty, and endless is my name, for I am without beginning of days or end of years. And is not this endless? And behold, thou art my son, wherefore look, and I will show thee the workmanship of mine hands. But not all, for my works are without end, and also my words, for they never cease. Can you feel the eternal nature with which the Lord is speaking to Moses right from the get-go? Almighty, endless is my name, end of days, end of years, is not this endless? Look at the workmanship of my hand, and he shows them worlds without end, works without end, words without end. Big picture stuff here. Verse 5. Wherefore, no man can behold all my works, except he behold all my glory. And no man can behold all my glory and afterwards remain in the flesh on the earth. Meaning you've got to be transfigured, resurrected, translated. You've got to be up in heaven, caught up under that spiritual power to have access to the, to the light of Christ and his knowledge, the, the hive mind of Zion, right? Of, of the celestial kingdom to be able to comprehend that kind of thing. We cannot comprehend it in our mortal state. Verse 6. And I have a work for thee, Moses, my son. For thou art in the similitude of mine only begotten. So he's telling him who he is after the, be, the likeness, right? That's what similitude means. And mine only begotten is and shall be the Savior, for he is full of grace and truth. But there is no God beside me, and all things are present with me, for I know them all. And now behold, this one thing I show unto thee, Moses, my son, for thou art in the world, and now I show it unto thee. There's this language of being in the world, Moses. Right? Moses is saying, you're, you're one of my children. You're, from my, you're like my son that I will send in to save you guys. Um, but you're not of the world. So this is kind of the introduction. Big cosmic introduction from the Lord coming in with, let me show you the creations across the cosmos. And it came to pass that Moses looked and beheld the world upon which he was created. So he goes right to planets. The world is the planet. And Moses beheld the world and the ends thereof. And all the children of men which are and were created of the same he greatly marveled and wondered. And the presence of God withdrew from Moses. So the light and spirit withdrew from him. That his glory was not upon Moses. And Moses was left unto himself. And as he was left unto himself, he fell unto the earth. And it came to pass that it was for the space of many hours before Moses did regain his and receive his natural strength like unto man. 
And he had said unto himself, Now for this cause I know that man is nothing, which thing I had never had supposed. So he saw a vision so vast and expansive across the cosmos, planets populated, and the power of God in this being that was with him, transfiguring him, that he had created all of those things. And he realized how insignificant he was, how powerless man was on earth who could not who could not move a mountain without the power of God's help, right? Yet here, here he sees God moving entire galaxies and universe uh, in the universe, right? Verse 11, the final uh, capstone of this section. But now mine eyes have beheld God. So he sees, again, this continued theme of seeing with what we're doing here. But not my natural, but my spiritual eyes. For my natural eyes could not have beheld, for I should have withered and died in this presence. Man, a lot of power must have been there. But his glory was upon me. His light was upon me, and I beheld his face, for I was transfigured before him. Um, I wanted to read 27 through 39 in that same chapter as well, because it's where it brings in the planetary aspect, where he says, And it came to pass, as the voice was still speaking, um, well, he has his encounter with Satan, and then the Lord comes back to him to give him uh, more vision. And he says, And it came to pass, as the, the voice was still speaking, Moses cast his eyes and beheld the earth, yea, even all of it, and there was not a particle of it that he did not behold, discerning it by the Spirit. And he beheld also the inhabitants thereof, and there was not a soul which he beheld not. Well, this is more than I thought I would read. Um, we'll go through it. Um, but da, 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 where was I? Okay, so he sees um, right here. And he discerned them. Okay, and I beheld the, also the inhabitants thereof. Uh, so he sees the earth and all the, the inhabitants on it. He discerned them by the Spirit of God, and their numbers were great, even numberless as the sands upon the sea. And he beheld many lands, and each land was called earth. So he's seeing many planets. And there were inhabitants on the face thereof. And it came to pass, or maybe, look, this is saying it's the dividing of the earth. So maybe we're not to the, where he's just showing him um, this earth. So the dividing of the earth, he's showing the, the dividing of the lands and the many inhabitants on the face thereof. And it came to pass that Moses called upon God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, why these things are so, and by what thou madest them? And behold, the glory of God was upon Moses, so that Moses stood in the presence of God and talked with him face to face. And the Lord said unto Moses, For mine own purpose have I made these things. Here is wisdom, and it remaineth in me. And by the word of my power have I created them, which is mine only begotten Son, who is full of grace and truth. And worlds without number have I created, planets without number. And I have created them for mine own purpose. And by the Son I created them, which is mine only begotten. And the first man of all men have I called Adam, which is many. So on every planet that's created, Adam is always the first man. But only in account of this earth and the inhabitants thereof give I unto you. For behold, there are many worlds that have passed away by the, power of, uh, by the word of my power. And there are many uh, that now stand, and innumerable, innumerable are they unto man. But all things are numbered unto me. For they are mine, and I know them. And it came to pass that Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Be merciful unto thy servant, O God, and tell me concerning this earth and the inhabitants thereof, and also the heavens, and then thy servant will be content. He's like, I want to know about this stuff. Verse 37. And the Lord God spake unto Moses, saying, The heavens, they are many, and they cannot be numbered unto man. And when he says the heavens here, I believe he's referring to to planets in the creation and, and things that are out in space, right? When you see heavens, think of space. It's heaven. If you want to talk a celestial doctrine, I think in my mind space doctrine because this is what he's talking about. This is what he does. He creates and organizes uh, matter from a disorganized state and elevates and exalts them. So he says, The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The heavens, they are many, and they cannot be numbered unto man, but they are numbered unto me, for they are mine. And as one earth shall pass away, and the heavens thereof, even so shall another come. And there is no end to my works, neither to my words. For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And we went over that scripture a lot in our Whitestone thesis, but here we're connecting it to this, this planetary aspect, this cosmic aspect. You can't put people into a probation and give them bodies without a host or a place, an environment. Um, and there are some special words all throughout mythology and symbolism that describe this kind of thing, that there has to be a host or a planet for man to uh, like symbiotically ascend up into divine they're uh, all divine nature even the planets themselves are ascending to a divine nature we're all ascending okay so there's moses's account and i'm sorry that was long but i think it's important because i'm trying to hammerhead this home what did these these men these uh, men of god see these visionary men well when when looking through the urim and thummim abraham saw planets and stars 
and governing and all these things about cosmology. What did Moses see? Oh, the same thing. And the Lord explaining it, that under the influence of the spirit and in a transfigured state in my body, I can understand and comprehend and remember them all, but you can't. Okay. This is what I'm offering you through the covenant is basically what he's showing him. He's giving him the big picture. So once again, planets and stars and the infinite. When a seer is initiated into the exceedingly high mountain, he is shown the proper context within which he is called to witness and testify. The big picture, the boundaries, the cosmology, the nature and order of the universe. The Lord is not a novice, President Clark remarked, and he is willing to show us his expertise if we would knock and part the veil in faith. We can know who we are and where we are. We can see it. Now consider the experience of Peter, James, and John. In Doctrine and Covenants, uh, 63, 20 through 21, we get uh, a bit of context of what they saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, besides Moses and Elijah and tra uh, translated beings and things like that. Um, what did they see? It says in verse 20 of 63, Nevertheless, he that endureth in faith and doeth my will, the same shall overcome and shall receive an inheritance upon the earth when the day of transfiguration shall come. When the earth shall be transfigured, even according to the pattern which was shown unto mine apostles upon the mount, of which account the fullness ye have not yet received. Right? So what did they see when they had a transfiguration event? They saw cosmic stuff. They saw cosmic level of redemption, a transfiguration of the whole planet and solar system. There are other scriptural examples, like that of the three Nephites, who were also caught up into heaven and saw unspeakable things when they were transfigured. So if they're caught up into heaven, again, what's that word, that trigger that we just said? Space. They're caught up into uh, space, and, and they see things they're not allowed to tell us yet. And here we have John and James and, and Peter all seeing as well something that they're not allowed to give us a full account of yet, right? This is cosmology. This is the doctrine of planets and how things work in space, the order of heaven and earth. So cosmology is the vision of the prophets and the plan of salvation. It is the beginning and the end and the process in between, including a scale that involves all things, especially planets and man. It's why we see this in the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants. It's why we see it in the temple. It's why we also see it in every single culture and mythology that exists. The true cosmology can tie it all together. It will resonate with and draw out the underlying shared truths that we may circumscribe them all together. Joseph Smith restored this key and foundation in true prophetic tradition. I love it. This is my manifesto. This is what I'm talking about. So next section. And again, I appreciate you for being here. Uh, this has been a little longer than I, or longer than I thought, um, but it'll be worth it. So this is about uh, where we get into some of the supporting doctor. Um, well, we'll just read it. Sorry, I'm a little bumbling this morning. So we are stardust and children of God, the law of likeness. Okay, now remembering, this is an interjection of a Twitter thread that pertains to this big picture. So we are intrinsically bound. Intrinsically means like by nature. We are intrinsically bound to planets and stars, for they are what we are made of and currently embodied by. They are our symbiotic host. And let's look up what that word means, symbiotic. Symbiosis is when the living together or, or uh, the living together in more or less intimate association or close union of two dissimilar organisms right? Dissimilar means not the same. Well, planets and man are not the same. They're different types of, of, of likeness, right? They're different things for sure, but we live in harmony together. That's the, the goal. So it's a cooperative relationship as between two persons or groups. Okay. So symbiosis. So we're in a symbiotic relationship with our host or the planet. We have dominion over it, but we also have a um, delegation or a duty and responsibility to um, exercise proper stewardship over it. Now, I encourage you all, I'm not going to do it here, but uh, go back and read when you, if you have a chance, or next time you read it, remember this idea of a symbiosis between man and planets, or man and host. Now read Doctrine and Covenants 130, verses 1 through 11. This is the Whitestone section. But in this context, note the, uh, actually, I, I actually want to look it up, because um, it doesn't quite make sense unless we do. So let me go back. I'm going to the scriptures here. I'm going to go to Doctrine and Covenants 130. I think it's just verses 1 and 2. Um, where it talks about an old sectarian notion, which is something I wasn't familiar of when I first read, you know, Doctrine and Covenants and things, but apparently at the time of, of Joseph Smith and in modern Christianity, maybe today, some people still believe it, that the Lord God, Jesus, can actually appear within your heart, like abide in your heart with you as a spirit or something. Um, but here he says in section 130, when the Savior shall appear, we shall see him as he is. We shall see that he is a man like ourselves. Okay. This drives the Christian world crazy, that we believe God as form of man. And that same sociality which exists among us here will exist among us there, only it will be coupled with eternal glory. 
which glory we do not now enjoy. So sociality, meaning our kingdoms, uh, families, the social structure right now we see, the base of it is family, and that, that'll be what we we have in the future. That's why God's a man. It, it continues. Um, and then here he addresses the scripture. It's verse 3. In John 14, 23, the appearing of the Father of the Son in that verse is a personal appearance. And the idea that the Father and the Son dwell in a man's heart is an old sectarian notion and is false. Okay, so I'm bringing this up. Why am I bringing this up? He's talking about this idea of dwelling and abiding within a heart, right? The same idea of exaltation and resurrection and the sociality existing in heaven like it does here. And then this goes on to talk about where does God live? He lives on a planet like this earth. Or, or they, they do not reside on a planet like this earth, but they reside on a globe like a sea of glass or a resurrected or transfigured planet, right? That's what they live on. Um, and so it, this whole section, it's, it's talking about this symbiosis between planet and man and how there's this literality to it or a literal nature to it all. So um, I say in this, read that whole section again in this context and note this connection he's making. And this is a true seer. Uh, this is what I see. I see Joseph Smith as a true seer correcting this mistake, knowing what seeing is, knowing what heaven is like, having seen it, experienced it. <clears throat> He's the one explaining, no, this is not, this is not true. You got to break it down. Uh, we are in this symbiotic relationship with planets and they will be resurrected and are a part of the planet salvation as well. So in the same revelation as the white stone scriptures, which have to do with resurrection and this celestial state of things. So yeah, it, to me, there's no coincidence here that this is on Joseph's mind as he's receiving these revelations and writing these, these, these things. His head is in celestial doctrines, cosmology. So without the dust and the fruit of, I'm um, talking about why we're connected to planets here. I'm um, sorry, I'm going a little, a little rambly today, but it's all right. This is an awesome topic, and I could go all kinds of different directions. So if I don't have it written out here like this and read it, that's why I'll just go crazy. Without the dust and the fruit or bread of the earth, we would not have a physical body, nor could we sustain it. At the planet level, without a governing star, the sun currently, neither the earth nor the mortals upon it would have life. There's this symbiotic relationship there between planets and stars, right? But I would say that they're not dissimilar. And so not so much a symbiotic relationship as it is a familial relationship. And we'll get to that in our next cosmology episode when we talk about the doctrine of um, planets becoming stars. So uh, re continuing here. And who is it that organized and that powers the earth and the moon and the sun and the stars? It's the son of God, a holy man, and he is the source of all light and truth. In Doctrine and Covenant section 88, verses 6 through 13, we get confirmation of this. He that ascendeth up on high... As also he descendeth below all things in that this is pole again, high, low, black, white, house of God, house of the devil, um, mortality, immortality, this, this, this binary thinking. He that ascendeth up on high also descendeth below all things. It's the scope. He's, he's stating the scope here in that he comprehended all things that he might be in and through all things, the light of truth, which truth shineth. This is the light of Christ as also he is in the sun. And, the, and is the light of the sun and the power thereof by which it is made. So what organized the sun? Not gravity. It was the light of Christ, light. It was Jesus Christ, okay? A man. As also he is in the moon, as is the light of the moon and the power thereof by which it was made, as also the light of the stars and the power thereof by which they were made, as also the earth and the power thereof, even the earth upon which you stand and the light which shineth, which giveth you light is through him who enlighteneth your eyes which is the same light that quickeneth your understandings, which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space, the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. It is light. Now, I composed, uh, like I said before, a Twitter thread that I'm going to stitch in here to elaborate on what I call the law of likeness. This is directly related to the eternal round aspect of cosmology or cosmogony. Cosmogony is the, the origination and study of the beginning of man, not just the universe and planets specifically, but specifically man. Um, but our cosmology includes all that. We know our divine purpose that we're in families and planets are in families. So our celestial, and we also, um, th this law of likeness relates to our celestial destiny as children of God. So one of the talking points for those who wish to cheapen the doctrines and revelations of the latter days is to point and scoff and ridicule and mockingly state that members of our faith believe that they will receive their own planet. Well, fools mock. Let me get a drink before I uh, start in on this. And again, thank you for, for listening. <coughs> Got a little tickle, a little tickle in the throat. 
this thread though i feel like i have to post it like once every month at this point um because some christian or somebody on uh, twitter or somebody else you know wants to say mormons aren't christians or mormons believe that they can become like god and blah 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 and then there'll be the nice you know uh, members of the church who may not understand this doctrine um, as complete in, in a complete fashion that will agree with them. They're like, no, well, we don't believe this or, and they don't understand the doctrine. So I created this thread with that intention first to kind of post and educate and say, Hey, no, we, we believe this. We shouldn't be running from it when they say you believe you're going to have a planet. No, we should be leaning into it and saying planet. No, multiple planets, please. And universes without end innumerable. You can't even count them. You're thinking way too small. So hang tight. Let me take a drink of this and then we'll read it. All right. So we believe that celestially, spiritually, we are literal children of God passing through a test of incarnation through lower states, a fall. So notice this pattern in mortality that we see. Chicks become chickens. Calves become cows. Lions, cubs become lions, right? Seeds become the parent plant. Children become men. Like after likeness. Family, right? This is what we see everywhere fundamental building block of our societies in genesis verse 1 24 through 27 we have this likeness being expressed where it says and god said in the creation let the earth bring forth the living creatures after his kind cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind and it was so and god made the beast of the earth after his kind and cattle after their kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and god saw that it was good and god said let us make man in our image after our likeness okay it's the same kind that was just being expressed there and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them here is the doctrine that we all believe or, or that we believe that makes the gentile christians indignant and blinds their understanding of god's covenant promises to become joint heirs with christ in all or to become like him Lorenzo Snow's famous uh, phrase, as a man is now, God once was. As God is now, man may become. Is that statement doctrine though? Yes, it is. And I have a link here that expressly says that. But before I do that, let me read this comment from uh, Bruce R. McConkie on what joint heirs with Christ means. He says, and I took this from the New Testament student manual um, over the chapters Romans 4 through 8, which covers this scripture where it says that we, sh we will become joint heirs with Christ. So he says, explains, what, it, what does it mean to become joint heirs with Christ? A joint heir is one who inherits equally with all other heirs, including the chief heir, who is the son. Each joint heir has an equal and undivided portion of the whole of everything. If one knows all things, so do all others. If one has all power, so do all others. Uh, so do all those who inherit jointly with him. From Mormon doctrine. Now, this link that I have here links to an article from the church that says this literally. Is President Lorenzo Snow's oft-repeated statement, as a man now is god once was as god now is a man may become accepted as official doctrine by the church and the answer is yes as we'll read through here um, but i took out some excerpts that that will explain it so i encourage you if you if you're don't believe me you want to read it for yourself the links are right here so joseph smith's first vision gives us corroborating evidence that god the father is a glorified man we look like him his likeness Joseph also taught that God was once as we are now, passing through a mortal probation to earn his exaltation. So from Elder Lund's article um, that I just linked there, there's a little section that explains this. The prophet Joseph Smith himself publicly taught the doctrine uh, the following year, 1844, during the funeral sermon of Elder King Follett. God himself was once as we are now, and as an exalted man, and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. It is the first principle of the gospel to know for a certainty the character of God, and to know that we may converse with him as one man converses with another, and that he was once a man like us, yea, that God himself, the father of us all, dwelt on an earth the same as Jesus Christ did himself. And that's from the teaching of the prophet Joseph Smith that he pulled the quote. Um, but that's from Elder Lund's article where he affirms that this statement is doctrine, that we are a, a, a church that believes in apotheosis or theosis, and that that's the whole sacrifice of Jesus Christ is that he is providing a way to elevate us, to ascend, to become like God, our father, literally. That that's his purpose. In Moses 139, he says, this is my job to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And he does it on as many planets and with as many faithful souls as are willing to take upon the yoke of celestial law. 
So please refer to, if you want more information, the Gospel Topics essay on Becoming Like God for more. We are organized in families. Animals are organized in families. Plants are organized in families. Planets are organized in families. The goal of eternity is the perpetua perpetuation of eternal families. Do you see why we place so much emphasis on the family? It's a pattern. Now, contextualize that with current times and the inversion of the family, uh, the proclamation of the family in, in culture right now, where you have a divide in the church, where you have people that don't want to talk about it or address it. This is fundamental. This is so fundamental. So the people who are at, at odds with the family proclamation, it is not, uh, well, we know where the root of the problem lies in that they're not understanding or comprehending the plan of salvation in that this is fundamental, that families are eternal and that male and female are absolute truth necessary. So here are a few passages from the gospel talk, topic essay that I linked above that I felt were especially notable. Becoming like God, Joseph Smith continued to receive revelation on the themes of divine nature and exaltation during the last two years of his life. Imagine if he wasn't martyred, what else he would have revealed about these things that I'm so passionate about and that we are just barely scratching the surface of what he began. Think about it. I am so angry that they martyred him, but at the same time, I understand. I get what's going on. Okay. In a revelation recorded in July 1843 that linked exaltation with eternal marriage, the Lord declared that those who keep covenants, including the covenant of eternal marriage, will inherit all heights and depths. Then, says the revelation, they shall be gods because they have no end. They will receive a continuation of the seeds forever and ever. Progeny, family, seed. And also from that same article, Joseph told the assembled saints, you have got to learn how to be a god yourself. In order to do that, the saints needed to learn godliness or to be more like God. The process would be ongoing and re would require patience, faith, continuing repentance, obedience to the commandments of the gospel, and reliance on Christ. Wow, I hope that I've set up my podcast here and our paradigm and how we're going to seek the world to be focused on this, and I'm always going to go back to this. And I want you as listeners and people and, and my friends and in family and everybody— this is what we should be encouraging each other to constantly revisit are these these fundamental basics, this recipe for becoming like God. So like ascending a ladder, individuals needed to learn the first principles of the gospel and continue beyond the limits of mortal knowledge until they could learn the last principles of the gospel when the time came. We get stuck on first principles of the gospel and we forget that Joseph Smith and the temple and the Lord himself are inviting us to co continue beyond to the next principles, the last principles of the gospel, of resurrection, of exaltation, to lift our eyes and sight to that end goal. It is not all uh, to be comprehended in this world, for sure, Joseph Smith said. It will take a long time after the grave to understand the whole. That was the last time the prophet spoke in general conference. Three months later, a mob stormed Carthage jail and martyred him and his brother Hiram. Now, as somebody who loves this work <laughs> of circumscribing all things and, and I could see what he was teaching and what he knew and it resonated so much more with my soul than the milk toast um, fornications of the modern church doctrine with modern science and philosophy that I see everywhere. This is my manifesto and rejection of that. Let's go back to what Joseph Smith, the early prophets, and all prophets and the scripture teach about cosmology. That's what this manifesto is. The logic is concrete and the revelation is clear. Yet our doctrine of who we are as literal children of God is not the same as accepted doctrines of mainstream Christianity. So they see our position on this as blasphemous and potentially polytheistic, but it is not. It is fully supported by the scriptures. And I put in just a few here. Psalms 82. Um, thus, I'm just read the chapter heading. Thus saith the Lord, ye are gods and children of the Most High. A psalm to Asaph. So in here he says, they know not whether they... Uh, I have said in verse 6, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. In verse seventeen or chapter 17, uh, 1 Nephi, in verse 36 through 39, uh, Nephi says, Behold, the Lord hath created the earth that it should be inhabited, and hath created his children that they should possess it. Again, that we are literally his, his children inhabiting this earth that was created for that purpose. And he raised up a righteous nation. Here's our house and destroyeth the nations of the wicked. There's that bifurcation again, bifurcation, that binary bicameral house right there, just in one verse, cut up. Good house, right, righteous nations, righteous nation, wicked nation. And he leadeth away the righteous into precious lands, and the wicked he destroyeth, and curseth the land unto them for their sakes. Again, the righteous have a thing, the wicked have a thing. He ruleth high in the heavens, for it is his throne, and, his, and the earth is his footstool. Um, 
I always throw in the cosmic language. We'll go over the footstool and the earth <laughs> later, but this is why I included those three verses, I think. But the main point is that we are children of God, that we are literally after his likeness. So now let me establish what God's purpose is as an exalted being stated to Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. And we already read this scripture. It's to, it's to create um, worlds without number, that they never end. It's an eternal round. And to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. His mission is to continually perpetuate the immortality and eternal life of man. What was eternal life again? Well, from the gospel topics section on eternal life, this quick paragraph says, eternal life is the phrase used in scripture to define the quality of life that our eternal father lives. The Lord declared, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Immortality is to live forever as a resurrected being. Through the atonement of Jesus Christ, everyone will receive this gift. Eternal life or exaltation is to live in the presence of God and to continue as families. Okay, so everybody gets resurrected. That's a gift for everybody. But eternal life is to have the continuation of families. So like immortality, this gift is made possible through the atonement of Jesus Christ. However, to inherit eternal life requires our obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. And a little bit more from Elder Bruce R. McConkie. He taught about the importance of coming to know God. It is one thing to know about God and another to know him. We know about him when we learn that he is a, a personal being in whose image man is created. When we learn that the son uh, is in the express image of his father's person. When we learn that both the father and the son possess certain specified attributes and powers. But we know them in the sense of gaining eternal life when we enjoy and experience the same things that they do. To know God is to think what he thinks, to feel what he feels, to have the power he possesses, to comprehend the truths he understands, and to do what he does. Those who know God become like him and have his kind of life, which is eternal life. Think of Nephi and the sealing power and how the Lord said, I know that you won't ask to do anything that I wouldn't want to do. You think my thoughts. You do what I want you to do. You do what God does in bringing to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. Ministering on the earth as a mortal or in resurrected realms, perhaps creating celestial hosts for, for more children, right? Like this is the gospel and the priesthood, the, the perpetuation of life and creation. So at a macro, biggest picture level, how does God perform this mission? Well, it's through the creation, the organization of planets, and by seeding them with spirit children who he incarnates to an exaltation or degree of glory based on their agency. He invites them all to be like him in his kingdom. Do we know that there are other inhabited worlds and planets? Yes, countless. And in Doctrine and Covenants 76, verses 22 through 24, it says, And now, after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony last of all which we give of him, that he lives. For we saw him, even on the right hand of God, and we heard the voice bearing record that he is the only begotten of the Father, that by him and through him and of him the worlds are created and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters of God. Joseph Fielding Smith also supports this idea, saying, We testify that God, through his only begotten Son, the creator of this earth and of all worlds without number, all of which are peopled by his spirit children. And that was in conference, 1971. We believe all life will be exalted to a righteous degree of glory or lifted up. Uh, can confuse exaltation with celestial glory. And I'm just trying to say, like, lift up that, that use of the word of, of being, uh, the verb being uh, exalted to a righteous degree of glory. Everybody, like, we, we we know, we believe we don't really go to hell unless you're going to outer darkness, right? And even then, it's not a flame of fire and and, and, and burning, uh, you know, red-horned demons all the time. It's, it's very different. But um, we believe that all people are going to be lifted and, and blessed with a resurrection that they will be happy with. They will know, well, that they will have desired, right? They might not be happy with it, and that will be their internal hell, knowing that they could have had more and been like God and had that um, ability to have the continuation of families. That will be a sore burden to bear. But it will still be uh, an exaltation of their, their powers and abilities and capabilities as a spirit or an intelligence even before that. So they've been exalted. So... All animals will rise in the resurrection. All plants, all planets, they are all integral parts of God's total work to bring to pass immortality and eternal life of begotten man. And I put some scriptures in here just to outline this fact that the earth will be uh, resurrected. It, it is a living entity, and it was created for man. And we have lots of scriptures in the guide to the scriptures um, that we can support this idea with, that God gave man dominion over the earth. You know, By the power of his word, man came upon the earth, um, and it was given unto, uh, right here, we will make an earth and we will, pr uh, we will prove them. Here, the scriptures are talking about this earth was for us to be proved. It's a simulation <laughs> for us. Yes, exactly. It is a, a probationary state, a test, a trial. 
don't buck the system. Learn how it works and, and play with it. Play along with it, meaning do the right thing. Do God's way and it's easy. The game is um, designed that way, that the more obedient and the more we give our will to the, to, to the Father, like Christ did, the more um, easily we can secure our exaltation in the next life. And here's some scriptures about the earth being made like into a crystal um, in DNC 130 there that I love to read, uh, meaning it will be resurrected, turn into like a star and um, hold celestial glory and power. And it is a living entity. We know that the earth abideth a, a law, so it can be obedient. It has agency. And Enoch heard the earth mourn aloud. So it definitely uh, is alive. And in other apocryphal, pseudepigraphal things, the earth speaks and all kinds of stuff. So it's planets are definitely um, living beings and also participating in the plan of salvation. Yet we ignore them a lot. Or if I want to talk about them, I'm the weird one. But it's like, you live on it, bro. <laughs> like, you can't escape the cosmos, but people do. We escape it with television, right? Instead of the vision of reality that includes these planets and cosmos and the stars and looking up to God for inspiration, revelation to see and understand these things, we're looking down into the seeing stones of the devil and uh, the LEDs, the light emitting diodes of uh, the enemy and the house of the kingdom of the world projecting false visions of reality, foundationless ones. If we are created after the image and likeness of our father in heaven, then our purpose and destiny is to do the work of our father that is in heaven. Jesus Christ is our exemplar, and by this, or and it is by His eternal sacrifice and merciful grace that we have redemption to seek and enjoy. He is the master and template of what our Father would do and be, um, of what we should do, and of what we can become. It is our goal to qualify through our obedience to return to His house and kingdom with our own glorified temples of flesh and bone, and to help bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. It is our privilege to help with the same work and pattern, even now in our weakness especially now in our weakness and probation in the forge of mortality when the hearts of crystallizing beings can more easily be broken and softened to be transfigured and embody a larger portion of light so basically saying right now in our probation is the time to change now is our time to climb the ladder and seek the divine resurrection that we want um, and it is by our use of agency our mind control our will control our restored temple experience and covenants are preparatory rites of ascension of this exaltation of going up the ladder or a transfiguration or a resurrection. It's a mock transfiguration is what the temple is, meaning it's a practice. It's a imitation, a pageantry of it. A We can live it and see it ourselves without actually being Abraham on the mount. That's what it is. They are elevating, exalting rituals. We are to participate in the same work as our father. It's a family business. President Nelson has said, exaltation is a family affair. Only through the saving ordinances of the gospel of Jesus Christ can families be exalted. The ultimate end for which we strive is that we become happy uh, that we become happy as a family, endowed, sealed, and prepared for eternal life in the presence of God. All signs and witnesses point to this conclusion. Those who receive the highest degree of celestial glory, the continuation of celestial progeny, will participate in the organization and seeding of planets after the divine pattern. It's not that we will just get one planet or our own planet as the ignorant mock. We will organize worlds without number and we will continue the celestial family chain. That is our very real destiny. It is within our divine nature that celestial genes can be expressed through the obedience to the absolute truth expressed through Christ. I should say found, not expressed. I said it twice. It's like a rap, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's poetry. <laughs> the family is foundational, okay? The fundamental unit of society. This is an eternal absolute. We are organized in families. Animals are organized in families. Plants are organized in families. Planets are organized in families. Planets become stars. Seeds become the parent plant. Calves become cows. Children become men. The goal of eternity is the perpetuation of the eternal family. Gods beget gods, like after likeness, each according to his own kind. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 131 through 2, we read this earlier. When the Savior shall appear, we shall see him as he is. We shall see that he is a man like ourselves. That same sociality which exists among us here, families, will exist among us there. Only it will be coupled with eternal glory, which glory we do not now enjoy. So a new light, a new power, a new situation, ability to move. There is no getting away from this. Families and planets and stars and cosmos are all an interconnected part of the gospel. If we are to become like Jesus Christ, we must see him in his full and cosmic glory as the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord of the heavenly hosts. Apostasy and foundational dissociation, identity crisis. These last few sections are a bit shorter, so um, we'll get through them quickly. 
I find it too much of a coincidence that the timing of the establishment of the kingdoms of the house of the world, as described in our prophetic paradigm, um, roughly 700 BC or 600 BC to uh, from Babylon as being the head, in, the golden head in Daniel, the vision of Daniel 2, which we talked about earlier. Uh, and I have an image of it here on the screen uh, if you're watching on YouTube that shows this timeline where the vision of the five kingdoms of, of the world begin about 600 BC. Let's just throw that out as the general um, time frame. About 600 BC to our present day is where this prophecy of the kingdoms of the world um, covers, okay? So I'm saying I, I find it too much of a coincidence that that timeline from 600 BC to now matches the timing of the seeds of the establishment of the age of philosophy and of the ultimate forking, bifurcation, <laughs> the forking and sabotaging of the foundational science of cosmology and all subsequent pursuits of wisdom set up where, therefrom. Wait, what, Leland? I know. Stay with me. Here's the timeline I'm referencing. Like I said, 600 BC to now, just get that in your mind, of the kingdoms of Babylon to Medo-Persia to the, the Alexander the Great to the Roman Empire now being split, bifurcated <laughs> into two, the Eastern Division and the Western Division. And um, the Dark Age is happening here, and now we're in the last days. Okay, so this is the timeline. But go back to 600 BC, and guess what? That's also the starting node for Greek philosophy. It's, it's called the Age of Rhetoric and Reason that begins. And what is this characterized by? Well, let's read a little bit about the father of uh, philosophy or the father of science, um, Thales of Miletus, right? This man lived from 624 about to six uh, to, to 545 BC. So right in this time frame of the same vision of Babylon taking over the kingdoms of the world being set up. And he is um, a Greek mathematician, an astronomer, a statesman, and a pre-Socratic philosopher from Miletus of Ionia, Asia Minor. So he was one of the seven sages of Greece, most uh, may, many, most notably, Aristotle regarded him as the first philosopher in the Greek tradition. Okay, and he is otherwise historically recognized as the first individual known to have entertained and engaged in a sci in scientific philosophy. He is often referred to as the father of science. So, what what is the big thing that he did? Thales is recognized for breaking from the use of mythology to explain the world and the universe. So, he is the one who breaks away from traditional cosmology and begins this dialectic of thought of a love of knowledge and debate and uh back and forth um of philosophies of men basically like this is this is the start of it and i don't think it's a coincidence that it's at the same time that babylon and the worldly kingdoms are being set up because this house of the devil is going to be governed by this philosophy of the devil here that separates itself from the cosmology of god so this is when the great and spacious building really starts to lift off the ground all right they separate and think about it. it's the same time lehi is having the vision right as babylon's about to come in and take over the uh, jerusalem and lehi and nephi are, and his family are leaving right to go to the promised land and he's having this vision of the tree of life and this floating house the great and spacious building the pride and ima vain imaginations of the world well nothing could be said more uh, 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 more comparatively um, accurate to, to call the vain imaginations of the world the philosophies of men <laughs> like these this the sophistry of talking into thin air without a foundation, without knowing the revelation of God and, and actually attaching it to reality is dumb. And that's what this was, this floating building. So here's what I mean. Uh, the age of philosophy brings a ping pong like shifting dialectic of consensus truth. So what do you agree upon and how can you get people to agree upon it? Totally detached from the original tree of knowledge, which included the cosmos. This detachment and swinging pendulum results in the shattering of universal wisdom into a myriad of false dichotomies like reason versus faith, or science versus religion, or philosophy versus mythology, or physical versus metaphysical, or physical versus spiritual, and so on. And they are all one at the root, according to absolute truth. So, I, and um, I missed the word win here, and it kind of <laughs> makes the sentence. But it's he's saying it, it breaks down um, what this detachment from mythology and the cosmology of the fathers of tying the planets and the sun and the stars and God to their organization and order and purpose, um, it creates this shattering effect, this this binary uh, within a, within the binary that they want to separate faith from reason or science from religion. But they're all the same thing according to absolute truth. But this consensus truth of dividing this up is entering into the scene here at the same time. This is what I'm pointing out. Doctrine and Covenants section 131 verse 7 it reads, there is no such thing as immaterial matter. So to speak of metaphysics, is actually kind of um, an oxymoron in our doctrine or things that, I mean, it, we do it for, for understanding's sake to say things are physical versus spiritual. Um, but in our doctrine, we know that all things are physical. All spiritual things are matter. They don't, they're, they're just more refined and we cannot um, process them. We don't have the sensory perception yet to interact with them, right? But they exist. They're real. It's not fake. It's not immaterial. 
that's a big distinction, especially that just undercuts a lot of the philosophy of the world by understanding what Joseph Smith restored in this materialism. Um, and there were versions of materialism in, in other philosophies, the Gnostics and things like that. I'm not saying it wasn't that it was original. What I'm saying is bringing it all together again into the doctrine of Christ is what Joseph Smith did that, um, that makes all the difference. This is, this is why um, philosophy like, has no effect on us if we understand these underlying doctrines here. It is an, in, um, an intentional separation of spiritual things from natural things to pursue the unrighteous desires of the carnal man, to trust in the arm of flesh. It is the dissociation, and often through trauma, war, oppression, or terror, of wisdom and truth, a confusion of our divine identity, Will for ig willful ignorance of the witness in the hearts of the fathers. All of this ignoring so that they can insert their own selfish lusts and designs into the floor plan of their house or their floating building. Now read Peter's warning in Second Peter 3, verses 1 through 7, when he says, My beloved, in my second epistle here I write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Okay, he's telling them, elevate your thoughts, clean your minds, lift them to celestial things here that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of the apostles and the Lord and Savior and of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, ooh, our time, scoffers walking after, the, now isn't this the floating building right here? Weren't they mocking, right? Exactly. Uh, the, yeah. Walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Then you say the Lord would come? For since the fathers fell asleep, our ancestors, or perhaps Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, right? When, when the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Or perhaps he's talking about Father Adam and the, pre, the pre-Diluvians, the antediluvians, right? That since they fell asleep and died, all things have stayed the way they are in the world and universe. Nothing's going to change. There will be no catastrophe. For this they are willingly ignorant, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, of old and the, um, wait, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world was then, being overflowed with water, perished. I want to do a whole essay on this, and I will, um, breaking this down, to go over what that means, out of the water, in the water. Um, but we need to get some more cosmology kind of foundation set before we do this. But just know right here, Peter's immediately talking about, they're going to talk about that, um, asking for, where's the proof of his second coming? He's not coming. Um, and since the ancients fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. Everything's just going along fine. The world the world, and the earth is humming along just fine. There's going to be no big apocalypse. There's no end of the world, Peter. This is what they're saying, basically. Where's the apocalypse, Peter? He's not coming. He's not coming, right? That's what they're doing. And what he's saying is, well, guess what? They did that before the flood as well. The old heavens, the old earth, they thought, oh, nothing's coming. Where's this big promise, Noah? You think God's going to punish us? Where's the judgment of God? And then the water came and the earth was, was ended. <laughs> and there was a new earth and a new, a, a, a new heaven. So this is what I'm getting at is that uh, Peter's going directly to catastrophism and these cosmic things, these cosmic um, cause and effect things that affect man on earth. That's what we're looking forward to, to the second coming. It's an advent. It'll be catastrophic. It'll be a burning of fire like an oven. <laughs> so this in context, just keep this in mind, that this is what modern science and philosophy of the day does is they're doing exactly what Peter said they would do. Scoffers walking after their own lusts, changing the foundation of doctrines. These scoffers have perverted the fundamental narrative and witness of God. This scoffing is a discontinuity, a disruption of blood memory, divine identity, and universal perception. It's a global plague of identity. They don't remember who they are or where they are, as Marcus Aurelius says. Dissociation is a scattering. Association is a gathering. Now from the DSM-5, this is your official manual on psychological disorders and things like that. Thank you, Adam. Uh, here, they describe it just as this. What is a dissociative disorder? Well, they're characterized by a disruption of and or a discontinuity in the normal integration of consciousness, memory, identity, emotion, perception, body representation, motor control, and behavior. Dissociative symptoms can potentially disrupt every area of psychological functioning, right? And I, like to, I just want to highlight this part here, which says the dissociative disorders are frequently found in the aftermath of trauma. Now, um, I wanted to go deep into this on like tie this to the mind control one because we, we can. And in the future, I think we will as we talk about MK Ultra and the use of trauma to cause dissociation, multiple personality splits, schizophrenia, these types of things. Um, and then you can program the mind and program them to do certain things and activate them with code words and all kinds of stuff that, that happens when you break people's mind and fracture them and help them forget their identity. They become kind of programmable. So this is huge in mind control, but look at how this is being done on the big, big stage from the start of these kingdoms of the world, of this floating building. Their philosophy is this. It is dissociation. Get rid of the old ways connected to God and mythology and literalism and materialism. Get rid of it. That's what they're doing. 
so that they can more craft it after their own image. So this dissociation from the truth accelerates in the early centuries after the crucifixion of Christ and martyrdom of the apostles with the ushering in of the dark ages in priesthood, a falling away from the truth and a reduction in the access to the saving and exalting ordinances. So a falling away from the plain and precious truths of the gospel would be discarded or it was a falling away where plain and precious truths of the gospel would be discarded and morphed, where the cosmology of the ancients and the fathers would be rejected in favor of the mingling with scriptures, the dark philosophies and creeds of men. That's profound. And um, writing this too, I'm just like blown away that it just all comes together so perfectly. Um, I hope I hope I'm expressing that. I don't hope it's not too wordy either. Um, I want to read that again, but for time's sake, I'm not going to. Just to like, ex- like really pick it apart and explain what I'm trying to get there. But I encourage you to do the same. The original uh, Meridian Church and the people of God, they would lose their identity as they had in the past, witnessed cyclically in the Old Testament and in the Book of Mormon. We see this, the pride cycle, right? You lose your identity. It would need to be restored by God himself in these latter days. So, and that's the stone cut without hands that does come and shatter the building, the old house, and restores truth in the mountain of the law. It would become the stone in the kingdom that topples the house of the world, not the woman who rides the beast. Elijah would need to come and turn again the hearts of the children to their fathers and vice versa. And he did so. That happened in Kirtland. The apostles warned that this would be so that there would be a falling away, that there would need to be a restoration. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1-3, through 3, reads, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as the, that the day of Christ is at hand. So let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come first a falling away, that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition right? The founder of this house of the devil, that he may be, may be revealed and stand and claiming to be God himself. We're at the cusp of that. Right now, we're still in mystery Babylon phase where the devil hasn't quite shown his face and claimed he's God yet, but um, we're at that point, right? So this is what we're talking about, that we're, we're still right in the middle of this falling away. The great apostasy never stopped, okay? The restoration has been a salting of the earth, but the great apostasy marches on, and it comes to a great head here where the church stands up and becomes an enemy to it. This small rock starts to become a problem for the kings, the kingdoms of the world. So Satan desires to divide and conquer the house of the Lord. One of the primary ways he does so is by attacking and challenging the foundation of things. Just as we've been discussing in the positive, to affect a change of heart within ourselves and transform our very nature and behavior is the pursuit of our celestial mind control, right? They're doing the opposite. We want to attack the foundations of our belief systems. Well, they're doing the same so that they can wrestle them to their own uh, lusts. So consider the history of Laman and Lemuel as an example of Satan deploying this uh, apostate modus operandi or operation of doing things, their method of operating. Laman and Lemuel, when they fall away from, um, let's see if I can make this bigger. Perfect. Okay. When they fall away and choose to separate themselves and Nephi leaves with his family and there's a division, a bifurcation of the house of Lehi, (laughs) right? This splitting, this scattering. Um, what What does Laman and Lemuel, what do they do and what do they teach their children? Well, we know. In the book of Mosiah, it says in verse 11, Now the Lamanites, they knew nothing concerning the Lord, nor the strength of the Lord. Therefore, they depended on their own strength, the arm of the flesh. Yet they were a strong people, so they were strong. They did, they did all right as to the strength of men. But they were a wild and ferocious and bloodthirsty people, believing in the traditions of their fathers, which is this. So this is what Laman and Lemuel taught them, believing that they were driven out of the land of Jerusalem because of the iniquities of their fathers, and that they were wronged in the wilderness by their brethren, and that they were also wronged by crossing the sea. And again, that they were wronged while in the land of their first inheritance. So this is victim 101 postmodernism that's that's happening right now. The church wronged me for this. The church did this. The church did that. Blah, 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 blah. They're going back to the foundation and projecting their failures and, and sad things onto the reality of what happened. This always happens. This Satan does this all the time. So I hope we're recognizing this pattern in real time right now with loved ones that you know that are leaving the church for reasons like this and wanting to point the blame at the wrong foundation because they have it backwards. But this is what they do. Uh, Laman and Lemuel in verse 13, Mosiah 10. And again, they were wronged while in the land of their first inheritance. And after they had crossed the sea and all this because that Nephi was more faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, he was favored of the Lord and the Lord heard his prayers and answered them. And he took um, the lead of their journey in the wilderness. And, and his brethren were wroth with him because they misunderstood not the dealings of the Lord. And they were also wroth with him upon the waters because they hardened their hearts upon the Lord or against the Lord. In verse 15, 
And again, they were wroth with him when they had arrived in the promised land because they had said that they had taken the, or, or they said that he had taken the ruling of the goss, of the people out of their hands and they sought to kill him. They were murderers. They thought he was trying to set up a kingdom for himself. Like they had this worldly view the entire way, this house of the world look and focus. And again, they were wroth with him because he departed into the wilderness as the Lord had commanded him and took the records which were engraven upon the plates of brass for they said that he robbed them and and thus they have taught their children that they should hate them and that they should murder them and that they should rob and plunder them and do all they could to destroy them and therefore have an eternal hatred towards the children of Nephi. So Satan put it in the hearts of these wicked fathers to corrupt the truth and change the very foundation of reality so that it creates this giant conflict moving forward. So I asked this question in my own head, like what version of history did Cain teach his posterity, right? Laman and Lemuel destroyed the truth of the past to push their own selfish narrative. Um, the Book of Mormon points to this tactic being used during the Great Apostasy as well. And we can read in Nephi's vision again of our time. He says, And after they go forth by the hand of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, from the Jews unto the Gentiles, these words, Thou seest the formation of that great and abominable church, which is the most abominable above all other churches. For behold, they have taken away from the gospel of the Lamb many parts which are plain and most precious, and also many covenants of the Lord which they have taken away. And all this they have done that they might pervert the ways of the Lord, uh, that they might blind the eyes and harden the hearts of the children of men. Look at this context of this podcast so far. Blind the eyes. Right. This is this is the mind control, the, the blinding of your eye. You don't see this and harden the hearts of the children of men. Right. Converting their desires into something that is not conducive to hearing the voice of the Lord and the direction of his covenants and plain and precious truths. This is exactly the mind control that Satan has, has deployed in these latter days in this final fourth beast kingdom uh, of iron and clay that we are enduring. Verse 28. Wherefore, thou seest that after, uh, after the book had gone forth through the hands of, of the great and abominable church, that there are many plain and precious things taken away from the book, which is in the book of the Lamb, which is the book of the Lamb. And after these plain and precious things were taken away, it goeth forth unto all the nations of the Gentiles. And after it goeth forth unto the nations of the Gentiles, yea, even across the many waters, which thou hast seen with the Gentiles, um, which have gone forth out of captivity, thou seest, because of the many plain and precious things which have been taken out of this book, which are plain unto the understanding of the children of men, according to the plainness of um, uh, according to the plainness which is in the Lamb of God but because of these things which are taken away out of the gospel Lamb he, he writes long run on sentences like I do <laughs> but because of these things that were taken out um, there is an exceedingly great many of them that do stumble yea insomuch that Satan hath great power over them so here's this majority again talking about now this attack on foundational truths continues today where do you see it in the world and look out into the world what are you interested in right now is it politics do you see a subversion of fundamental truths what about language do you see a subversion of fundamental language and understanding of things like man and woman being sub like totally inverted to, to mean the opposite? This is dissociation. This is massive um, sci psychological warfare being waged on the children of men in these latter days. Uh, and it's by the wickedness of men and the direction of Satan. It's this house pointing and scoffing and mocking at us all. I consider the rejection of cosmism by the early creedal Christian church or the creedal church as uh, and subsequent Protestant spawn perfectly in harmony with this principle and pattern. If you change the nature of the universe, you forget where you are and who you are. This type of apostate Christianity finds itself eternally at odds with the physical sciences and laws and subsequently misunderstands the nature of the spiritual ones as well. The apostate idea of creation ex nihilo is a primary example, but we'll get into the specifics of that in the next article in part two. Yet in our faith, physical sciences and religion are not at odds. This is, this is doctrine unique to the Latter-day Saints here, that Latter -day Saints, that true science is true religion. We believe that everything is matter, that spirit is matter, just more refined. I love this quote from Brigham Young. It hits the nail on the head on this subject and uh, the current divide between science and academia and the popular house of the world versus the revelation and the house of the Lord. Um, let's read this. Uh, it has been observed here this morning that we are called fanatics. Bless me, that is nothing. Who has not been called a fanatic who has discovered anything new in philosophy or science? We have all read the, of Galileo the astronomer who, contrary to the system of astronomy that had been received for ages before his day, taught that the sun and not the earth was the center of our planetary system. For this, the learned astronomer was called a fanatic and subjected to persecution and imprisonment for the most rigorous character of the most rigorous character. So it has been with others who have discovered and explained new truths in science and philosophy, which have been in opposition to long-established theories. And the opposition they have encountered has endured 
until the truth of their discoveries has been demonstrated by time. So he's saying everybody who's on the frontier of something, on the cutting edge of stuff, is always ridiculed and vilified and made out to be a fanatic by everybody who's comfortable and in the status quo. The term fanatic is not applied to professors of religion only. I will tell you who the real fanatics are. They are they who adopt false principles as ideas and facts and try to establish a superstructure upon a false foundation. They are the fanatics. And however ardent and zealous they may be, they may reason or argue on false premises until doomsday, and the result will still be false. If our religion is of this character, we want to know it. We would like to find a philosopher who can prove it to us. We are called ignorant. Psh, so we are. But what of it? Are not all ignorant? I rather think so. I love that quote from, from the swag in it. It's just palpable to me. But this idea that the real fanatics are those of the house of the world who have no foundation. Their floating building is foundationless, yet they are building this massive superstructure and claiming to know all things and mysteries of God. And it's, it actually doesn't involve God at all. Look, we're involved from monkeys or this or that. It's just ridiculous ideas that are detached from the tree of life and reality. Again, this slide, um, a lot of these slides are from a slideshow that I put together. I wanted to, we were going to do this, um, my friend Mino and I, but um, didn't get to it. But these are some of the slides from it. And this is talking about the, the chemistry of dissociation, that this is what the apostasy did. It's separating temporal, natural things from eternal, spiritual, supernatural things. And this is why a lot of, you know, the Christian church, they don't believe God has a body and cosmism and talking about the planets and things just taboo. It, it, and, and Nibley supports this idea as well. And, and we'll read some of that. But this is what this slide is. Um, we believe that true science is true religion. And there are three quotes here from prophets, modern prophets who affirm this. First from Ezra Taft Benson, where he says, Religion and science have sometimes appeared in conflict, yet the conflict can only be apparent, not real. For science seeks truth, and true religion is truth. There can never be conflict between revealed religion and true science. Truth is truth, whether labeled science or religion. All truth is consistent. There is no conflict. Only in the interpretation of fact. It is well to remember that when men make new discoveries in their energetic search for truth, these will always be in harmony with all fundamental and eternal laws. Yes, truth is always consistent. Whether it is revealed directly from God to man through his inspired prophets or comes from the laboratory through diligent searching of his children and through the influence of the Spirit of the Lord upon them. All truth comes from God. Okay, So there's no conflict between science and religion. Uh, and this is what I advocate for. This is what the Cosmos Manifesto is building a foundation to see. If we're going to talk and fix the foundational science of cosmology, well, it will and inevitably affect the superstructure of sciences on top of it, meaning physics, astrophysics, quantum physics. These types of things I will demonstrate and show must be readdressed foundationally when we fix the foundation of cosmology that their floating building is set upon. President Nelson says this, there is no conflict between science and religion. Conflict only arises from an incomplete knowledge of either science or religion or both. More succinctly put, he has a way of really saying things in compact manner for our short attention spans. He's like the perfect Twitter aggregator. Like he, I, um, He's very good with words. I love all the prophets are. Everybody enlightened by the Spirit. Even Mr. Tep Benson here because I love the detail and the context that this adds. But in, this is the same point. <laughs> I, I just love it. I think of these things, though, when I see a short quote like this. President Eyring says, is there any conflict between science and religion? There is no conflict in the mind of God, but often there is kind of conflict in the minds of men. <laughs> I love that. Our position is clear and unique, and we owe this position at its core to the Lord's restoration of the temple and cosmology. Is it any wonder with all of this that our current prophet is pointing us all to reinforce our spiritual foundations and find time in the temple? No, this is the consistency of God and a powerful witness to me that he leads the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It fits the historical pattern and witness. These are the perfect fruits of a prophet of Jesus Christ. What is he doing? He's encouraging us to fight the brainwashing of the house of the world with the temple and the brainwashing of the house of God and the house of the Lord and of absolute truth to seek that through revelation and have our own experiences in finding it. I have a slide here on the, the prophet's invitation to do this. And this is from his October 2021 general conference address titled The Temple and Your Spiritual Foundation. He says, we are sparing no effort to give this. Oh, and he was comparing and speaking to the renovation of the Salt Lake City Temple um, and its foundation as our opportunity as well to do the same. And, and just between you and me, I feel like that's a countdown. 
<laughs> it's a countdown to see when the Salt Lake Temple will be ready and earthquake proof. Uh, it means they're expecting an earthquake, right? So at any point after the, the completion of the Salt Lake Temple, um, it's go time. And I think that's been the countdown for me personally as well, thinking about my own spiritual foundation and trying to get things in line that I want to be fixed and ready to go the same time the Salt Lake City Temple is. Um, and at least making that my goal has changed my life. So I appreciate this prophetic counsel. I witness that if we follow it, um, the Lord will guide you in it. So going to it, he says, we are sparing no effort to give this venerable temple which had become increasingly vulnerable, a foundation that will withstand the forces of nature into the millennium. In like manner, it is now time that we must each implement extraordinary measures, perhaps measures we have never taken before, like listening to Leland's three hours podcast. <laughs> okay, I get it. These are long, but it's worth it. To strengthen our personal spiritual foundations, unprecedented times call for unprecedented measures. My dear brothers and sisters, these are the latter days. If you and I are to withstand the forthcoming perils and pressures, it is imperative that we each must have a firm spiritual foundation built upon the rock of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. So I ask each of you, how firm is your foundation? And what reinforcements to your testimony and understanding of the gospel are needed? The temple lies at the center of strengthening our faith and spiritual fortitude because the Savior and his doctrine are the very heart of the temple. Everything taught in the temple through instruction and through the Spirit increases our understanding of Jesus Christ. This essential ordinance, uh, his essential ordinances bind us to him through sacred priesthood covenants. Then, as we keep our covenants, he endows us with his healing, strengthening power. And oh, how we will need his power in the days ahead. I testify, this is, this is uh, why I feel compelled to put this out there, that this study, awareness, and diligent effort to understand cosmology and what Joseph Smith restored, it will light a fire your heart and your testimony of him as the prophet of the restoration of the church of what president Nelson is doing, because like I'm seeing and picking apart from the talks that he's giving, he is preparing us in this same foundationally um, important way to understand the mysteries of God. He's preparing us to be a Zion people. And I see it. I feel it. So uh, almost the final section, the temple and the and divine association, the cosmic university. So here's the opposite. We talk about apostasy and dissociation. Well, just like the prophet said, the temple is where we can go to um, bind ourselves to to Christ, to this idea of circumscribing all things to one whole and guiding our will in life by that paradigm. So the good news of the resurrection and the gospel, the restoration of the priesthood, the Book of Mormon itself as a witness and a tool is all a gathering of the members of the body of Christ, which is absolute truth. It is a remembering of all things, especially our divine identity. It is an association and a circumscription of all creation. The gospel serves to align us in harmony with God and nature and all the natural and divine law, while the philosophies of men, mingled with scripture, seek for men to establish a law unto themselves. It always goes back to the foundation. The temple is the original university, or the place where one learns of the true nature of the universe, where all things are gathered into one and are centered and move around Christ. Supporting commentary from Hugh Nibley and his book, Temple in the Cosmos. So here Nibley is going to, uh, I, be I believe he's supporting well, everything I've said pretty much to this point. He says here, the temple is an imposing structure. And if you're watching the YouTube video, I have a little diagram that he included in the book that points out some of these things to make it a bit more uh, understandable. He says, the temple is an imposing structure, the place where one gets one's bearings from the universe, a place for the gathering of the entire race at an appointed time, namely the new year, to celebrate the beginning of a new age, the common birthday of mankind, i.e., the begetting of the race in a sacred marriage in which the king takes the role of the first ancestor, Adam. It is the hierocentric point, the place where all time, space, and humanity come together. The word templum not only designates the template, the point of cutting between the cardo or decumanus, de decumanus, decumanus is a Roman word. I had to look this up when I first read the book. Um, but cardo and decumanus are the intersecting main roads of Roman cities the cross city center. So the Roman cities were built like a square and at the center was the augur or the temple. This is where the sacred uh, you know, revelations from God and divine um, rites were given. But at the center of the temple, the palace, whatever it was, um, the crossroads, the streets ran um, like a cross through the middle. And this is the cardo and decumanus or the intersecting point from which the, the cutting point from which the observer of the heavens makes his viewing. So you go to that cutting point, the center, and then you make your viewing of the universe to understand. It is also a diminutive of the word tempus, denoting that it measures the divisions of time and space in a single pattern, like tempo. There, uh, all the records of the past are kept and all prophecies of the future are divined. 
G. A. Alstrom concludes that the two basic symbols of the temple are, in general, one, its cosmic symbolism, and two, the paradise motif. Setting aside as uh, setting it aside as sort of a halfway house between heaven and earth. This is this is so much like I, my heart beams when I read these things, and I know that I'm seeking um, the mysteries in the right way because I understand what he's saying. I get it. And here he continues. He says, One center would establish others in distant places in the manner, as St. Augustine says, of a central fire that sends out sparks. Spiritual arson. Shout out to my boys. Sparks each one of these setting a new fire to scatter new centers, etc. So that the whole world is embraced in a common unity around a common center. This idea is reflected in concern with cosmology, a theme dominant in Jewish and Christian writings until... The schools of rhetoric took over. What are the schools of rhetoric? Philosophy. This is, this is exactly what I've been leading and building this all up to, to these comments from Dr. Nibley, where he says, the, this idea of everything rotating around a common center, that's exactly what I'm talking about, Melchizedek syncretism, synchronizing everything to the Melchizedek priesthood and the order of God, the doctrine that God has taught us, the doctrine of Christ. Everything rotates around it. This is the idea of... Of cosmology, he says, a theme dominant in Jewish and Christian writings until the schools of rhetoric took over. The earthly shrine is a microcosm of the cosmic shrine. So it is a fractal. It is conceived, I'm sorry, it is conceived uh, um, as preserving the proportions of the cosmic abode of deity in reduced measure. Okay. The temples, writes Rosny, were not only centers of religious life, but they were also centers of cultural, economic, and even political life of Babylonia. They were also schools and universities, somewhat like medieval cloisters. What does this mean to me? This is exactly what I was saying, is that before the kingdoms of Babylon and um, the vision of Nebuchadnezzar, right, and the, the subversion of cosmology by rhetoric and philosophy, before all of that, temples were the center of everything. That's where the divine rights, culture, economy, politics, um, education, all of these things, marriage, life, family, they were all bound and rotated around this, this center of, of the temple, right? But that was taken away with the establishment of the house of the devil. This is what the house of the Lord brings back with the restoration of the temple. This is why Joseph Smith, beyond the Book of Mormon, to me, undoubtedly is a prophet of God. There's no doubting it. With, when you look at the temple in this context and understand the Bible and the history of the Old Covenant and what they were doing as the tabernacle and building temples and that desire and, and all of it, right? And having to do with stars. What is the sign of Christ's birth and his coming and all of these things, but they are cosmic. It is a star, right? It is earthquakes and the earth in upheaval. It is catastrophe. It is all these things that the modern philosophical world of rhetoric and house of the devil denies. Now, we're going to watch a few minutes of Dr. Nibley here. Um, I'm going to let this play. I'm going to run and grab another drink because I've got parched mouth from speaking now for almost going two hours. And again, I thank you again. I thought this would be shorter, but here we go. Um, this is this is the MO then. But we're going to watch this. Pay attention to what he's saying here, and then we'll recap it. I've got it here. If you're, if you're watching, you can look along and see what I've got text, but we'll go over it all. Here's Dr. Nibley on cosmology. So, we have our facsimile two in the Pillar of Great Price, which is a hologram. That's one of the best you can find. I'm not going to talk about that now. But then you also have science fiction, which is our latest expression of this idea, that to enter into the picture, to be part of it, uh, the cosmos has to be in there. Now, it's a strange thing. They call it cosmism, uh, and it is banned from religion today. You're not even supposed to mention it. This is an interesting thing, because it used to be the whole show. And, of course, this is what the Pearl of Great Price restores uh, uh, with a vengeance. Cosmism. Just, just pause it for, for a second right there. This used to be the whole show, he says. This is what the Pearl of Great Price restores with the vengeance. Cosmism, guys. This is my Cosmism manifesto. I'm not alone in this. I stand on the shoulders of giants, and I, I am appreciative of them. And I know I'm like a, a, a rat kid nobody out here trying to explain these regal things, and the academics st scoff their nose at me. But I, I have no care for them. I do not care. I'm here for you. They call it Cosmos. We'll put in quotes. How does that look? Oh, boy, what handwriting. I can write it otherwise. Fancy. Uh, now they say, now this is out. We cannot, can it, we cannot do this because this is, this is not religion. Uh, is cosmology an inherent part of religion? This is the question that comes up. One thing you have to remember with Dr. Nibley is he's speaking facetiously when he says, we cannot have this to do with religion. He's speaking like as if he were the early fathers of the church with the doctrines and philosophies mingled with men already. He's saying, we can't have cosmism. So it, it, don't let it be confusing. He's quite the character and will speak in character or in different languages suddenly and, and all of these things. He's like me in that, in that regard and that his mind will just kind of squirrel and go any different places. But he also mumbles, so it's kind of hard to hear. Um, these, 
this man is a genius. Okay, so just listen to what he's saying, though. But he is he is portraying what I have explained this far, thus far, that the early church rejected these ideas and they said they were naturalistic and they they had no place in the in the in the canon and things like that. Um, these are the plain and precious, precious truths that I see were fundamentally excised from from the scriptures. Uh, when revelation is denied, and they talk about deliteralizing and dehistoricizing and deeschatologizing and demiracalizing and deapocalypticizing the elements of the Bible, that is, all the supernatural elements in the Bible, we remove them if we want to find the real story, what the real kernel was. We can't, as we noted before, we're above that, uh, that primitive nonsense. The early Christians may have believed in that, but of course, we know better than that. We're scientific. Uh, See, he's joking. So don't take that literally. He's joking. He's like, see, oh, we just get rid of all that stuff. Uh, and uh, Neary says, if you, we've done all that, we've got rid of everything, we've de-eschatologized and the like, we don't really believe in literal heaven and the like, that means that cosmology will also have to go. But without cosmology and religion, an important ingredient is missing, uh, one which the Pearl of Great Price restores, actually. At all times, the doctors of the Christians and the Jews had driven cosmology out with a fork, as I call it, uh, for us, but it, kept, it always kept coming back. They could never leave it alone. The issue of how far the real universe is to be involved in our religions have left the learned sitting on the fence. The problem behind uh, much of the vagueness and difficulty of hermetic and gnostic literature is that, of course. Uh, the terrible questions would, uh, would disappear at a stroke, as uh, Lovejoy observes, that's a very important writing. It's not on reserve, but if you can get it, Arthur Lovejoy wrote a book called The Great Chain of Being. And it has... The Great Chain of Being. I need to write that down. Mental note, actually. <laughs> ...to do with what they believed about cosmology in the Middle Ages and right through. They always believed in a multitude of worlds and they always believed in the vastness of the universe and so forth. This was, this was a, it's always been part of it. And it, it's the modern world that got rid of it, strangely enough. But uh, Lovejoy, the great chain of being in which all things are, are related, it was the most sensational philosophy book of its time at the beginning of the century. <clears throat> but he says, <clears throat> just forget the, the cosmos, and then all your questions disappear as, as a stroke. At a stroke, and then all your, your answers disappear too. No questions, no answers. Nothing to bother about, but this is what we took it up for in the first. This is, this is so, um, this is my experience. I'm just testifying right now what he's saying. That as I've gone into cosmism and studying cosmology in a prophetic context from Joseph Smith, that all of the questions that I had before, whether it was the white stone, whether it was about planets and, and the flood or um, the the miracles of all kinds of things in the Bible, I'm going to go over those from this, this cosmological context to show how this paradigm and idea um, can translate to expand on meaning in the Bible to these more mysterious and supernatural type things. Um, we can do that. And this is what I, my experience is exactly what he's saying, that the cosmology aspect, when you put that foundation in, the answers start to, co to coalesce. It's amazing. First place to know, are there answers to these questions? Well, now, uh, <clears throat> the favorite source of this uh, cosmology in the Christian religion, it gets in and it stays there, is from Plato's Timaeus, the Pseudo Dionysius, we won't go into these, and Genesis. After all, it's the physical creation. God created the earth. I think it was quite physical, whether you like it or not. And uh, they won't let us deny the real universe. And consequently, this is Lovejoy speaking, the language of acosmism, that is, there is no cosmism in real religion. Acosmism just negates the negation of a cosmism. The language of acosmism, he says, is never to be taken too seriously. Nobody really does, which is interesting because they talk it all the time. One can't simply ignore the universe. I love that how he's like yeah they seem to they seem to not take that advice right he's saying you can't just ignore the universe is what a cosmism is the natural world today basically everybody out there don't want they don't want to mix religion and science as Van der Lever writes here there's a human inclination general as well as Christian to base the trust on one's salvation on the cosmic only when the human passion of a divine savior has a cosmic background does salvation seem sufficiently assured You've got to have it real. It doesn't seem to, the way he puts it. Erst wenn man die die Passion des Heilands einen kosmischen Hintergrund hat, scheint die Seligkeit genügsam verbirgt. Without that cosmic background to uh, to underpin it, he says, the idea of salvation is not sufficiently confirmed. Verbirgt. It's not strong enough. You need that underpinning because 
you can't leave that out of it. And yet Werner Jaeger, the great German classicist, who, whom I knew very well, I used to, because I was a Mormon and interested in very much, and he and his wife used to have me at their apartment, we used to talk a lot about these things. Uh, Werner Jaeger, in his classical work on the subject, he says, as a good Lutheran, that the two do not belong together naturally. In fact, that cosmism and religion are absolute enemies. You can never mix them, because one is spiritual and the other is physical. Here we go on that again. He says, the two do not belong to together naturally. It was Plato, he says. He, he wrote a book on this. Uh, well, his book called Aristotle, the title of the book is Aristotle, Werner Jaeger. Um, it was Plato who converted astronomy. Previously, the essence of atheism was astronomy, imagine that, into the essence of theology. Now, what a, what a thing Plato did. Before Plato, uh, astronomy was the essence of atheism. There was a uh, Sagram's whiskey. We'll just we'll stop it at there. 1230 is kind of all I wanted to get out. This split of naturalism versus spiritualism um, or natural versus spiritual um, and, and bringing up these pre-Socratics or, or Socratic philosophers or Plato. You know, like this is the age of rhetoric and philosophy that he's talking about being the force that um, corrupts the understanding of cosmos or cosmism. Uh, so my main takeaways from that little clip there are these Facsim facsimile two in our uh, Pearl of Great Price is about cosmology. In fact, the whole Pearl of Great Price is about cosmology, right? But there it is from Hugh Nibley, and he calls it a hologram, which I think is an uh, amazing concept in its in its uh, self that I I probably should uh, write an essay on to explore better. But it's the same idea of the fractal gospel, the microcosm within the macrocosm, um, as and the temple, that kind of thing. Um, so he also says science fiction uh, as being part of the cosmos. Um, it's actually earlier on in this uh, presentation, he, he speaks a little bit more to it, but that the ideas that were emerging out of science fiction in his day, in the 90s and 80s there and things like that, 70s, that they were um, in harmony and in line with these ancient texts and cosmologies that explained how the universe worked before, that they were much more in accord with the gospel than anything else, and that that was good, that that's what we should be doing. That cosmology is inseparable from religion, and it used to be the whole show. He says the Pearl of Great Price restores uh, all this with a vengeance, and one simply cannot ignore the universe. I think the biggest uh, and, and hardest-hitting one, though, out of that clip that we just played was when he says that only when the human passion of the divine Savior has a cosmic background can salvation be sufficiently assured. That you have to know that he's a cosmic god and he has cosmic power. Otherwise, there will always be that doubt. I'm sure I'll use more clips from that sermon. Uh, it's a nibbly classic. Still, let's continue to add some layers and paint to the canvas here. Um, here are several Hugh Nibbly excerpts uh, from his book, One Eternal Round, relating to cosmism and cosmology that support, again, this general idea that we're expressing in this, uh, in this essay. So this one's called Out Cosmos Out Nihil uh, from One Eternal Round. Though medieval and modern theologians vigorously condemn cosmism, the view that the universe is self-contained and uncreated. There is, to quote the eminent Egyptologist Gerardus van, uh, van der Lue, a human inclination, general as well as Christian, to base, one, or, or, or to base trust on one's salvation on the cosmos. Only when the human passion of a divine savior has a cosmic background does salvation seem sufficiently assured. Here he's repeating that quote that he uh, gave in that sermon. Hence, Arthur O. Lovejoy can conclude that in religious writing of any period, the language of a cosmism, that's what he was saying, is never to be taken too literally. Like, don't don't take anybody seriously who isn't including the cosmic, the cosmic in um, their worldview and paradigm. This is like uh, Marcus Aurelius' quote at the beginning. You want to you wanna applause from those who know not who they are nor where they are. Like, that's what everybody is seeking in the rat race of the world. Like, a bunch of people who aren't enlightened to know the true meaning of, of the earth. And, but, but I don't mean it in a pompous way like that. But like, like Nibley said, the temple is the hierocentric point. As, as hierophants ourselves, meaning we've been initiated into higher knowledge, it is our responsibility to witness and testify and bring others to it, to feed the sheep. This was... The white stone last last week, right? This is this is our mission to see, witness, testify, and to bring others unto this circumscription of all truth uh, to the gospel of Jesus Christ and the obedience to that gospel. So he says the language of a cosmism is never to be taken too literally. So Origen, one of the uh, initial Christian scholars, first and best informed of Christian theologians, declares triumphantly. When finally, for example, the saints shall reach the celestial place, then they shall discern in detail the systematic knowledge or ratio of the stars. Indeed, they will also understand the principles of the works of God, which he himself will reveal to them. 
This is the teaching of the early brethren for which he is an authority. But Origen's own Alexandrian training breaks through. Alexandrian meaning uh, Egyptian and, and the, in the philosophies of the world. Um, Alexander the Great, uh, the, the Greek philosophy, like all this stuff, like um, the worldly uh, schools of rhetoric seeping into Origen's um, training breaks through at the end, he says, of the passage when he appeals for perfect knowledge or scientia perfecta purged of all that is physical and corporeal like what what, what? you were going so good there origin until all of a sudden you want to purge all the physical and corporeal god without uh, corporal bodies it's just it's ridiculous but that's that's what he's pointing out nibbly's pointing out the same thing that i'm pointing to this cosmism is one of the most conspicuous and distinguishing features of mormonism among modern religions and its main support is the pearl of great price especially the book of abraham the soul's journey through the heavenly spheres is a central subject in the religion of the new kingdom writes Laszlo Kakosi, um, who goes on to note how the tradition, I don't know if I pronounced that right, <laughs> who goes on to note how the tradition carries on through Gnostic, Jewish, and early Christian apocalyptic writing, while the idea is already perfectly at home in the pyramid texts. Yeah, the ancient religions before the kingdom of the world, 600 BC and on, right, like that, where this rhetoric takes over, they all understood cosmism and had a basic general um, agreement and accord as to what they experienced, saw, and witnessed. And they wrote about it. And they call, and, and modern people called it mythology and then discarded it. <laughs> like that's, that's kind of how it was. They misunderstood it intentionally to discard it and put their own ideas in. That's how I see it. So it's, it's, uh, it is real rather than fanciful realm. And more recent interpretation of Egyptian religion emphasizes the remarkable lack of any mystical aspects to the picture um, when he's talking about cosmism in the pyramid texts, which we must not confuse with the later speculations of the mystics. Still, the Egyptians uh, are trusting as much as the mystics to imagination and speculation. Let me read that over again because I don't know if I quite understood that. So let's see. He says, um, soul's journey through these things goes on to... so. Kakowski later goes on to note how the tradition carries on through the Gnostic, Jewish, and early Christian apocalyptic writing. While the idea is already perfectly at home in the, uh, the pyramid texts, the soul is journeying through the different spheres. And it is real rather than fanciful realm. And the more recent interpretation of Egyptian religions, a religion emphasizes the remarkable lack of any mystical aspects to the picture. So their, the recent interpretation of Egyptian religions must be wrong in my idea, which must not confuse with the later speculations of the mystics. Still, the Egyptians are trusting as much as to the mystics to imagination and speculation. It was Shesemet, Shesemetet who bore me, a star brilliant and far traveling, who brings distant products to Ra daily. The principal concern of the Egyptians is with the lower regions of the universe into which the stars descend and move from east to west, that being necessary if they are to rise with Ra's resurrection on the morrow, or Ray. Now we, uh, even now we have a singular pr privilege of gazing out with our natural eyes into the depths of infinity and beholding their worlds without numbers, to any of which we may retire. You shall take your, your ease on the firmament, you shall be more starry than the stars of the horizon. He's, what he's describing is the Egyptian religion. They incorporated cosmology into what they believed. And they believed that they, when you died, you went up and you became a star, like that you were part of the cosmos and moving on through a progression. Um, the stars are more than a backdrop. They are our destination, it says. Oh, morning star, make a path for me. May N or North or N be encircled by Orion, by Sothis or Sirius, by the morning star. That They may set you within the arms of your mother, Newt, the heavens. And I would want to see the real translation of these words because a lot of times when Sirius is translated or Orion or these names um, there's another parallel that is a bit more um, Velikovskian well we'll just put it that way that maybe it's not Sirius but maybe closer planets and not further stars but either way it doesn't matter what they're what they're pointing to is this idea of transcending or ascending from mortality into the eternal realms of the spheres of heaven and that's exactly what we believe. That's what we're passing from one estate to the next, our first estate to our second estate to our third and final estate, which we will repeat the round, right? That it's this lifting of things through estates and the spheres of heaven. Um, okay, here's another uh, clip um, where he says, a very important teaching of Abraham, which was recent, and this is just another section of the book, so it's not containing pertaining to this same um, section. So it says, an important teaching of Abraham, which has recently been attributed to the Egyptians with great emphasis and now occupies the center place in the arguments on cosmology is a form of anthropism. What is consciousness? Anthropism is like um, human divinity, like uh, theosis, basically. God, uh, humans becoming gods. What is consciousness? And would what would exist if there were no awareness, no intelligence? 
the Egyptian was convinced, as uh, Philippe de Chain has, has, has it, that by the mind alone, chaos is held at bay, mentalism implying that a cessation of thought would make ipso facto, or the very end of the universe. As Abraham expresses it, intelligence is all. It's the beginning that starts the seed that passes through the different forms um, on its way to exaltation, right? It is the id in identity. Um, in something like the ontological argument of Anselm, Abraham is taught that if there is a hierarchy at all, one intelligence greater than another, there is necessarily one which excels them all. And since intelligence is an indivisible thing, it brings and enfolds them all into itself. This is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. The, the word enfolding is being used uh, a good deal today with reference to the implicit and explicit reality of things. What did Joseph Smith tell us about figure one in the Abraham? In the first place, these are not pictures of anything. To use Smith's terms, the drawings only represent or signify, are pertaining to, or they answer to, um, are called by the Egyptians, and are said by the Egyptians, or they will be given in their own due time of the Lord, or they ought not be to be revealed, or they are to be had only in the holy temple of God, and are as revealed from God to Adam. To make it sporting, if the world can find out these numbers, they are welcome to try, he writes in some of the, the descriptions of the different things on the on facsimile, on figure one. Um, I love this. What, what he's saying here is he's, he's, he's trying to point and emphasize that Joseph Smith was deciphering symbols and speaking in a symbolic language that he wasn't doing what, um, an archeologist or an Egyptologist might do to find some, you know, cultural, literal tie to, um, something direct and, um, obvious, right? God speaks in parables and through symbols. And it's for only those who have eyes to see or only those who are established upon his foundation and doctrine and have an eye single to his glory that are able to discern the different meanings of symbols and things. So this is where I, be, I believe Nibley is making this, this distinction here. And it's important moving forward here. He says, what is being discussed here? If we single out the nouns and verbs in the official explanation, we can see what it is talking about. And as with the sophisticated uh, uh, Amun Amun or Amun Ra, Amun theology of the Egyptians, there is nothing mystical or magical about it. The words that make up the brief explanation are cosmology. Number one, the words used are earth, planets, firmament, sun, stars, moon, revolution. Two, measurement and number, geometry, right? Measurements of time, celestial time, day, cubit, years, 1,000, quarters, numbers, due time, revolution, equal with. He's talking about the description in the facsimiles in the book of Abraham, just again to recap where this is coming from. What other language is being expressed here as he, he breaks it down? Three, the transmission of power or energy, literally. And receive, what is it? It's receiving light, borrowing light, which governs the planets and stars. And that's how they receive their power. And it's their governing power is light. This is, this is uh, again, uh, next uh, essay is going to cover this as one of the main points of doctrine that is going to separate and be able to help us discern um, true cosmologies from fake cosmologies. Cosmologies that push anything other than light as the ultimate creative and powerful powering force or motive force is it has to be foundationally flawed. That's my big gripe with popular cosmology, black hole theories and um, Big Bang, is that they um, they do not place light in celestial mechanics, which is an, a grave mistake. It's a fatal mistake, and that's why their superstructure of science is going to collapse, and they need some new physics to figure out what's going on in the sun, these kinds of things. It's all tied into this foundation uh, being flawed and disregarding of light, which is fitting as the, the father of lies and darkness, the devil would do so, right? He would usurp that position of light. Hierarchy or dominion. Um, this is another topic that's being hit with these nouns in these, this text. Hierarchy or dominion or intelligence and purpose. Creation, residence, government, key, power, God, throne, authority, crown, light, holding the key, sitting clothed in glory, governing, Holy Ghost. These are the words that come out of this. This is cosmology. This is purpose. This is order. Um, five, ordinances, again, order, and procedures relating to the above uh, to humanity. Keywords, sacrifice, Holy Ghost, Abraham, Dove, Temple of God, Egypt. Another uh, item here is number six, last one, special idiom or, or notation to convey the above. So the figures represent or they signify or they're pertaining to, they're answering to, they're called by the Egyptians. This is the language Joseph is using. Said by the Egyptians, will be given, not to be revealed, to be had in the Holy Temple of the God, uh, given to Abraham as he offered sacrifice, if the world can find these numbers, etc. 
the opening statement of the sacred book of oh wait this is that's the end of that thought so let's let's cap that that uh, section from nibley up that he's pointing out that in the pearl of great price and joseph smith's explanations it is all cosmology it is all these things that are consistent with the ancient religions but not so much with the schools of rhetoric and modern day um babylon mystery babylon here's another um cut i think this is the last one i have from nibley that we'll go over in this episode but he says the opening statement of the sacred book of Hermes Trismegistus uh, to Asclepius, or the initiatory, uh, the initiatory teaching, and Hermes Trismegistus. A lot of people think this this is uh, Enoch or Enoch's writings or writings from Enoch are actually confused or the same figure or person as Hermes. And Nibley himself, in his book Enoch the Prophet, uh, postulates this. So this is not me being weird or anything. That's so. Think I, I like to think of that because it puts this into context. Context as Enoch being the scribe and understanding these things, the the order and ordinances and knowing the order of the stars and things, being a translated being and having that dominion and calling to minister into many planets and things. That it would make sense that cosmology would come purely from from a source like that, or John the Revelator, <laughs> who would be unto the same calling, right? Same same idea here. So um, in this sacred book of Hermes, it says it includes the first article of faith of the Hermetics. And I'm going to do an entire essay on uh, Hermeticism, or at least the Kibalion, which are the seven Hermetic principles of the three initiates, which is uh, like the sacred text of Hermeticism today. And I think I'll have to check the historicity on it, like when it when it came out about. But the seven Hermetic principles are so much in line with uh, just foundational doctrinal principles that we also ascribe to that it's good to keep them in mind and to be aware of them, to understand them in a celestial context or this Melchizedek syncretism context. So we'll do that. But again, that's another another essay uh, tease for you. But in this text here by Hermes, it says, God himself has led you to me, Asclepius, Asclepius. And if you see and understand, your whole mind will be filled to the brim with all good things. And you will recognize that all things are in one and one embraces all. This is kind of what, what, I'm, what I'm getting at here. This Zion idea, this all in one and one in all, this macro to micro and I like this whole mind will be filled to the brim with all good things. So filled with light. I feel like we have scriptures that talk about that, that the true, when we're full of revelation, we will be filled with light. Same idea, concept. This is similar to the inscription on Cleopatra's disc. Another thing he cites and has a figure, an image for. And this is the very essence of alchemy, he says. To bring the opposites together in one all-embracing whole as all the other alchemists teach. So this is, this is exactly... Um, what I'm trying to get at with this house versus house division thing, seeing past this bicameral mindset and bringing all things into one, seeing them in their proper global context uh, or a prophetic context. That's what this effort is. Um, I'm going to skip skip down here to this. The teachings are most common to religious, uh, or the, the, these teachings are most common to most religions, but there are five important points of early hermetic teaching which are rejected by conventional Christian, Christianity and Judea, Judaism but are found in the teachings of the early church. The doctors of the 4th and 5th centuries, after furious assaults, succeeded, succeeded in condemning the doctrines of, one, literalism, meaning literally you will be resurrected and there's a literal heaven that we go to. God lives on a literal planet in some other sphere or in space, like that kind of thing. They got rid of this in uh, the great apostasy. So, one, literalism. Two, cosmism, what I've been talking about. Three, plurality of words. I would include that in cosmism. I would include all this in cosmism, actually. And four, pre-mortal existence of man. And five, creation as organization of matter, not creation ex nihilo. This is important, right? So these things are rejected. That God organizes um, was is blasphemy to the, the creedal Christian world. All, these, all of these, um, as we have shown elsewhere, are accepted teachings in the earliest church and among the Jews. But let us return to our list of hermetic beliefs. Next, as Kroll points out, in the dialogue between Hermes and Thoth, it is taught that there is no destruction but only change, the conservation of matter, right, of material and energy. That's exactly what we believe. So we start out with the most familiar of all themes, rebirth, or the hope of redemption, and yearning of all mankind, assuming the foundation of platonic dualism. Spirit and, yeah, you get it. Um, dualistic nature of spirit and natural man. This world in the, uh, and the other world, the light and the darkness, more significantly, Hermeticism, rather than teaching creation ex nihilo, maintained that matter came not from nothing but from God himself. Divine spirit was thus the original primal ma matter, the alchemist's materia prima, from which sprang the universe, a doctrine taught both in the book of Abraham and Moses, 138. So the teachings of God and the universe, however, are merely a foundation for the doctrine of redemption. It is still our desperate predicament that comes first. Fundamental to this is man's dual nature as body and spirit, 
temporal and eternal. He not only progresses in this life, but will return to his heavenly father of the premortal existence. To qualify for this, he must keep his passions within the boundaries. Such are the elect as compared to the hylic, or merely carnal people. So again, this division he's talking about. House of God versus house of the devil. House of the, car house of the carnal. Mystery Babylon. As Nephi says, to be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded is life eternal. The elect are the perfect ones, the initiates, and they are few and, and um, unloved in this world. That's what we, and I like that, that it ends there from where we started, where we are of the world, but not in the world. And the, the world hates us because we're not of the world, that we speak a weird cosmology and we don't go along with their, their philosophies of men. So, all right, that's enough Nibley for today. I love you, Nibley. And I stand on the shoulders of spiritual giants. I'm truly humbled. Um, I'm also aware of the time. Now is the time to be up and doing. It is the dispensation of the fullness of times and the restoration of all things. So last section here, why is cosmology important? This is the hook. Uh, why should you even care about these things? I, I, I hope I've detailed enough scriptural evidence right now to slap everyone in the face to say, oh yeah, we should take this seriously if we want to take the temple seriously, right? That's what my answers here to this question are. I get this all the time. They say, Leland, uh, your, your love and passion of the cosmos is cool, but this isn't essential for my salvation, right? Like this isn't, you don't need to know this to go to heaven. I hate that question. I really do because it's being willfully blind is really what it is. So here's my answer to it. It is technically not essential to know or understand for salvation in mortality, these things, okay? But it is knowledge that is foundational and inseparable from exaltation. So anybody who asks me that question, it's, a, it's, it's saddening and disheartening to me because I feel like if you're wanting to have your mind and heart in the celestial sphere, thinking of celestial doctrines, like Joseph Smith exhorted us to think of death and the resurrection and our eternal glory and, and what's next, right? your initial reaction and guttural response to me bringing up something cosmic as being, this isn't necessary for salvation, is it? Is an obvious barrier to me that you're just shutting bars down and you don't want to talk about celestial things, <laughs> which which offends my, my inner spirit. But I have gotten better at not being offended outwardly to people and being more understanding as I started in the beginning, realizing that people are living different um, levels and are at different levels on the spectrum of understanding. And that if I can meet them where they're at and provide these breadcrumbs, instead of being offended at the outright disengagement from celestial doctrines that I get from so many members of the church, right, that um, I'm learning that this way is much more effective to meet people where they are like the Savior did. And um, it's humbling. So we are responsible to own our own conversion. This is it, right? If you want digger to dig deeper roots, like I started in episode one with, with why I'm doing this, to dig deeper roots and understand and have a testimony of Joseph Smith and the gospel and the doctrine, it's your responsibility to learn this stuff. It's your responsibility to find the time to listen to, to Leland for two and a half hours or whatever so that I can give you these ideas so that you can go and turn them into your own fruits uh, of study and introspection and pondering, right? Go go take your own vein and attach it to this greater chain of life as Nibley described it there in that um, video or Lovejoy described as. Um, here's a, a, just a quote from President Nelson reinforcing this idea that we're in, in charge of our own conversion. I plead with you to take charge of your testimony, work for it, own it, care for it, nurture it so that it will grow, feed it truth. Don't pollute it with the philosophies of men and then wonder why your testimony is waning. This is the answer, guys. This is every progmo uh, philosophy is based on this house of lies. So subvert it. Go underneath all of those ideas of critical theories, right? With being critical to the foundation and adding cosmology to your repertoire of understanding in uh, the gospel, right? This is my defense that I'm offering for you. This is the weapon. Load up, boys. Mount up. Get your tools. Let's go, right? Reason number one. Let me give a few clear reasons why cosmology is important. And I think it should be, you should, you should consider it necessary for your salvation. For man cannot be saved in ignorance, right? And what you gain in this life gives you that much of the experience in the life to come. So don't come at me with this, I don't want to learn that stuff right now. It's like, okay, maybe now is not the time. But to pull other people down who might be on this path is not being, uh, not participating in the work of God of elevating souls. That's all I'll say, right? So reason number one, the temple literally and figuratively is covered in cosmological symbols and instruction. How can we fully understand the instruction available through the temple and the symbols there if we don't understand its cosmological components? If we aren't aware of the cosmological doctrine that Joseph Smith restored and the difference that it poses when compared to the world? If we're not seeing this stark difference and understanding them, then we're missing blatant open symbols that are blinking and barking at us when we're at the temple. I've learned that for myself and I testify. And that's why I'm so passionate about this and why I use sharp language in this is that I was taking these for granted in my life. 
and now I'm not, or I try not to, and I'm trying to be better at it. And in that pursuit of trying, the Lord has reached out abundantly to bless me, and I know he will for you too. Reason number two, the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants is replete with cosmology. How can we truly understand what these books contain and provide if we are ignorant to cosmological principles? It's rhetorical. You can't, right? And if Harold B. Lee was telling the church that we were condemned for not taking the Book of Mormon seriously, I truly hope that we're at that point now through Come Follow Me and what President Nelson is doing in preparing the church and the saints to repent and to, to find a higher law, that we have graduated and that we are taking the Book of Mormon seriously so that we can move on to these more foundational issues of cosmology that the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants so clearly and succinctly present to us. So that's reason number two. Do we want to understand the scriptures better? Well, then cosmology is necessary because it's all over the scriptures. Question or reason number three. We can't truly understand prophecy without understanding symbolism. And both rely first on a proper understanding of cosmology. This is huge. This is a key to how do I understand symbolism and can see symbols and things and how I train my mind to see divine symbols and the manipulation of them. Is that you cannot I I this is my opinion. You cannot understand prophecy. I cannot understand prophecy. I couldn't understand prophecy without first seeking to understand symbolism in a proper cosmological framework. Let me say that again. I personally did not understand prophecy until I started to take symbolism and the temple and cosmology seriously and to, to um, do some spring cleaning in what I believed in the world and what my foundational ideas of cosmology and the temple were. When I did that, I started to understand prophecy with clarity, in waves, in just forcefully from the Lord and the Spirit saying, here, look here, look here, look, look, look. And it just lines up like ta-ta-ta-ta-ta. You start growing and understanding things exponentially. A true root. Cosmology must unify all existing versions or branches derived from it. Understanding restored cosmology allows us to do this. I've got some cool pictures here. Um, they'll come up later. I'll explain them at some later date for sure. But this one on the left, if you're just curious, it's the Joseph Smith Memorial it's a little uh, obelisk and statue, but it's from viewed above has a very curious shape and form that we will go over in detail in later episodes. Same with the um, all seeing eye that we see here, as well as in the celestial room of the early Salt Lake Temple, there was this statuette of a, a um, scalloped uh, Venus statue or Mary or female or some people say it's Christ some people whatever it's just this fe feminine looking angel and this in, and two cherubim this entire symbolism is cosmic and it ties back to these ancient understandings um, that I will bring into the picture that makes us different and makes us a peculiar people if we are taking these things seriously and not conforming to the popular theories of the world in terms of where we come from who we are and, and where we are Another one from um, another mentor and rest in peace, Anthony Larson, was also very big and um, has informed me a lot on his ideas on cosmology. I differ with him um, a lot, and I'm going to outline that as we move forward. I'll do essays on some of Anthony Larson's work and his positions versus mine, but um, I am grateful for him. But here's another reason straight from him that I love, and it, it jives with this idea of prophecy and symbolism um, and being expanded or more clearly understood when seen through a proper cosmology framework. So he says this. There is yet another reason that we should study cosmology. The cosmological elements once seen in Earth's ancient skies, so witnessed by people who were here on the Earth, they gave rise to a universal sacred language of myth, tradition, and religion the world over. So the things that our ancient fathers actually saw on the Earth and experienced, they witnessed and testified of, and we consider it mythology or tradition or religion of you know ancient cultures and things but these are should be considered as well cosmology science like these are, this is witness we can't discard this system of symbols anthony says and metaphors because the common denominator of all sacred thought and teaching in whatever or, oh wait this system of symbols and metaphors became the common denominator of all sacred thought and teaching in whatever ancient culture thus any prophet could capitalize on these commonalities to convince prospective converts that he had the truth this is what John's revelation is, by the way. John is, I think maybe he brings that here. Let's, let's read it first before I go tangent. He says, the Savior taught in that way, as did his apostles. We see Peter, for example, in the New Testament, rehearsing the cosmological history of the world from the flood forward to both the Jews and the, um, both to the Jews and the Gentiles about the change in earth's heavens, a key principle in their pagan belief system that enabled them to accept what Peter subsequently taught about Jesus. We see John in his marvelous apocalypse doing the same by inserting Jesus the Christ into pagan traditions common to the Hellenistic culture of the day, making it easy for Greeks, Romans, Egyptians, Persians, and Jews to see the Savior in their own particular cultural fashion. 
I love this. This is interdisciplinary studies at its core. And that's what I actually studied formally at Arizona State University was integrative studies in the new school of inter integrative um, interdisciplinary uh, arts and sciences is what it was called. Big, long name. But it's integrating all these things and finding commonality and parallels between them. That's my gift. That's what I do. That's how I rap. That's how I make poetry. That's how I do the art and the music. That's that's what this is, is, is I'm leaning into this talent um, and applying it intellectually to my spiritual learning. And this is this from Anthony, Anthony Larson is another big reason why I, I consider cosmology important because I can minister and reach out to other cultures, whether it's Aztec or anything in the Americas or ancient uh, Europe or Africa or wherever it is. We can see these commonalities among cosmology when we understand um, what Joseph Smith restored in the temple. So this cosmic layer of the gospel is adding a more robust temporal understanding to our spiritual understanding of the gospel, which in turn enhances and edifies both when pursued with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Our next task will be to get more specific. We'll next identify a selection of cosmological revelations that Joseph Smith taught that I consider to be my core interpretive baseline for understanding restored cosmism. These points of doctrine will guide our discernment and ability to filter and synthesize all other pure information from the noise within the foundationless house of the wisdom of the latter-day world. I invite you to write down any thoughts or impressions you may have had while exploring these ideas with me. I'd love to hear your insights. And that's the end of the article. And I appreciate you listening and sticking it out. This was long, again, two and a half hours. Um, I appreciate you. I love you. And if you would, just like, do a little heart on my Substack there or on Spotify, give it a thumbs up or whatever it is, or if it's on YouTube, um, just for visibility's sake so that we can give these weapons and tools to as many as who have the patience to sit and listen to my voice for this long. So I uh, love you. I appreciate you guys. And with that, we'll exit out.